they claim that our eyes will just be created a slight different from what they are when we talk to the same power. Welcome to Strange Familiars. How are you doing, Allison? I'm doing well. As the resident Flannel Man witness, I have to bring you in <laughs> on all Flannel Man shows, or at least some Flannel Man shows. <laughs> Seems appropriate. Before we get going, if you have a story you'd like us to cover, if you've seen something strange, something unusual, something paranormal, cryptids, UFOs, ghosts, Bigfoot, anything like that, you can email us, strangefamiliarspodcast at gmail.com. We're always looking for stories. How are you doing, Allison? I'm doing well. Are you suspicious of my technical skills? I ruined a whole... Yeah, it was only like two hours of work. <laughs> <laughs> I ruined a whole uh, show that we recorded for patrons, so which we have to re-record. I think I'm going to have better answers this time, though. Yeah, it's, it's the Ask Me Anything show, or the Ask Us Anything show. They're still... Or Ask Me Anything again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's still some time to get your questions in maybe (laughs) although we might record it before this goes live so we'll see we're doing strange familiars sweatshirts oh cool for summer Uh, hey (laughs) cold summer nights that's true did not you always need a sweatshirt on vacation when we need to go as a kid i mean right now it's like mid-may and i'm sitting here with a a blanket blanket wrapped around around you yeah so we're going to be doing zipper hoodies with the Strange Familiars logo and another design on the sleeve. We'll be doing pre-orders for those. So if you're interested and you're not on Facebook, you won't see the pre-order. So contact me. Patrons, I'll do a pre-order also for patrons. and Patrons will get a discount on these. But if you're not on Patreon, if you're not on our Facebook page and you want a Strange Familiar sweatshirt, contact me, because I'm probably only going to make a few more than whatever is pre-ordered. So there might not be a lot around. So if you want to guarantee you get one, go ahead and contact me, strangefamiliarspodcast at gmail.com. Put sweatshirt in the subject (laughs) and let me know your size. They call them hoodies now, you know. It's a hooded sweatshirt, also (laughs) known as a hoodie. However, we are going to be taking payment up front for those because they're going to be expensive to make. But they will be cool. They were going to be pretty neat. They're definitely going to be professionally silk screened and should be something something pretty neat, limited edition. We're not going to have them all the time. So. This isn't going to be one of our getting the silk screen press out of the garage and lugging it up to the back porch. We are not printing these okay. ourselves. No, these good. will be good to know. These will be professionally printed. I don't have the silk screen technology to print on sleeves. Oh, yeah. So there's going to be a sleeve print and a breast print on it. Mm-hmm. They're going to be cool. But tonight, we're revisiting our favorite wood hick, the man in red and black. <laughs> Old faithful, as far as this podcast is <laughs> <Yeah>. concerned. <laughs> Flannel man. We got a lot of readings tonight and interviews and some really cool stuff. Like, this is... The flannel man thing is perhaps not unexpectedly getting weirder as time goes on and the stories are getting weirder and I'm certainly convinced whatever this phenomenon is, it's more than a ghost. It's something else. And we'll talk about all that as we go on. Jade, the witness who pulled on Flannel Man's beard on Halloween yeah. <laughs> with the pumpkin seed, she found this awesome history of Buffalo Plaid, and it got lost in my email folder, so I'm sorry, Jade, I didn't see it for weeks, mm. and then I just stumbled upon it. And this might give the best clue yet to, like, we keep asking, like, what is it about the plaid? What is it about the plaid? There's, there's something in here that's pretty neat. This comes from tartansauthority.com so we can assume they're authorities on tartan marble man wart roy rogers wart 
Tom Mix wore it, as did the mythical Paul Bunyan, legendary lumberjack of a thousand comic strips, and no self-respecting gunslinging cowboy would be seen without it. Buffalo plaid. As American as apple pie. Or is it? Officially, buffalo plaid, or check, is plaid with large blocks formed by the intersection of two different color yarns, typically red and black. Hang on a minute, isn't that the Rob Roy tartan? It most certainly is, and it's said that it was introduced to North America by a descendant of Rob Roy, one Jock McCluskey, sometime lawman, bounty hunter, fur trapper, gold miner, and eventually Indian trader. In the Indian's eyes, McCluskey was no ordinary white man. Awed by his strength and size, he was hailed as an invincible warrior, both feared and revered. He was equally admired for his compassion. In the anti-Indian holocaust that followed Custer's last stand, he was a rare white man indeed who dared to champion their cause. His reasons were as simple as they were personal. Their persecution and plight mirrored his own family clans, descendant from nobility to hunted criminals. Befriended by the Indians, McCluskey became one of the era's near-vanished middlemen, a white man welcome among the Indians who effortlessly mingled between two warring rivals without fear or retribution. From the Lakota Soy and Cheyenne, McCluskey bartered for buffalo pelts, offering a myriad of finished goods in exchange. The most coveted among the Indians were the heavy-woven Scottish blankets, their dense, hardy weave colorfully emblazoned with his clan tartan signature red and black colors. According to McCluskey's great-nephew, Gregor McCluskey, Sioux and Cheyenne warriors were in all of its color. None had ever seen such a deep, rich red. They believed its intensely rich hue of red to be a sorcerer's hex, a dye distilled from the spirit blood and ghostly souls of McCluskey's prey and enemies. A belief McCluskey did little to correct. Worn in battle and draped across their war ponies, it was prized as a good luck talisman and revered as a spirit guardian that would deliver immortality even in the face of death itself. Sioux and Cheyenne warriors called it plaid, the Gaelic for it was pronounced plaidger, and I probably pronounced that wrong as did U.S. Army outposts and fort traders who bought McCluskey's bartered skins and plaids. Hence was born, sometime in the late 1880s, the unique and confusing American term plaid, referring to tartan itself, rather than the use of which it was put. It was a very short step from there to the tartan of McCluskey's Rob Roy blankets becoming known as buffalo plaid. So, yeah, this is just one source, you know, but... This is the as close we've got to it meaning something like sort of supernatural. Mm-hmm. That buffalo plaid. A rich hue of red to be a sorcerer's hex. A dye distilled from the spirit blood and ghostly souls of Mikulski's prey and enemies. Prized as a good luck talisman and revered as a spirit guardian that would deliver immortality. So we have some hint, uh, at least of some tradition it yeah. seems. of their, These are very rich color. Of their, their being a sort of um, supernatural component, you know, to the plaid. It's, it's the first hint I've found to it. Ivy wrote in, and she shared her brother's flannel man account. I like when they're secondhand accounts when it's like, it's too scary to talk about. I'll have to get someone else to talk about it for me. Or She's attempting to get her brother to come on the podcast. So we'll see. Maybe we can get it firsthand from him because he has apparently some other stories. So this is what Ivy said. This would have happened back between 2000 and 2001. He was home visiting my parents in eastern Massachusetts since he lived in Boston at the time. I was still living at home and about 20 years old and he would have been 26. He said on, that on one of the nights he was staying at my parents' house, he was up late after everyone had gone to bed and was watching TV. The living room faces the dining room and kitchen. It is in the corner of your eye if you are staring at the TV. He said all the lights were off except the living room light. It was very late, probably well after 11.30 p.m., and suddenly something moving in the kitchen caught his attention out of the corner of his eye. He looked into the kitchen doorway, and slowly and in a non-threatening way, a man comes out of the darkness and into the dining room. My brother stared at him for about a solid 15 seconds, and then the man vanished. He described him to me as being about 6 feet tall, medium build, about 29 or 30 years old, reddish brown hair, a matching color, gruffy beard, and mustache. He also told me he was wearing a red and black checkered plaid long-sleeved dress shirt and pants that he didn't get enough time to focus on. 
Even back then, he told me, well, he looked like your typical lumberjack. My brother was confused about him standing there out of the blue, but never felt scared or threatened by this person. Years went by, and now just recently I found out it's a thing others have seen too. It's very strange and interesting at the same time to think of what this is or what it means for those who see him. My brother has had many high strange events happen to him. He's also seen by me and at least three other people in broad daylight during a time he was somewhere else sleeping soundly. He's also had missing time for a whole day, and I'd love to share that story with you too, if that's okay. And she did tell me the story, but she said she was going to talk to her brother and maybe try to get him on the show. So maybe we can hear the missing time story from him. Are you surprised by any Flannel Man stuff anymore? Is it Not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> So remember Winter, we read her experiences on the show. Uh, she had not heard of Flannel Man, and I forget whether we read hers on a patron episode. She had written in yeah. with some experiences that she had when she was younger and so mm. forth. But uh, she had just begun listening to Strange Familiars at that time. And since then, she's caught up, and she's found that Flannel Man is a thing. And she said, oh, I had this uh, dream with a, this flannel-wearing person in it. Mm -hmm. So she wrote in with this dream. This is recent and weird because I've been listening to your podcast for weeks and it didn't occur to me until today that I did have this really weird dream. I didn't have an interest as much in the Flannel Man stories, so I didn't listen to those in depth until now. Okay, so here it goes. I have semi-lucid to fully lucid dreams. I tend to believe that there is some malleability to the dream space, and I have had what feels like contact or communication in dreams. These dreams are almost always particularly clear, distinct, easy to remember, and sits with you the next day. I often write this stuff down just to get it off my mind. This time I didn't because I dismissed it after searching for this wolf dog thing for a few hours the day after and asking friends for opinions and no one seemed interested. So I'm sleeping and I suddenly become aware of myself standing in the middle of a road, a black paved road, no road paint, tree lined on either side, and it immediately looks like dense forest. I'm standing right in the center of this road. Think foggy, cool, you can see your breath, it's early fall on a main back road in the morning. I've been there some moments, and I'm just kind of looking around and taking stock of where I just found myself and registering that this place feels unusual. To me, that's an indicator that I didn't create this dream space. I hear footsteps off to the right and ahead of me, branches snapping. So I look over just in time to see a man emerge from the forest. He looks like a lumberjack. He had a hatchet, beard, dark hair emerging from a rolled up skull cap, and hiking boots, scrunched up looking socks over pant legs. I honestly have this weird feeling, like, how did I forget this? Then listening to episode 26 today, I just had my mouth drop, and I suddenly remembered this guy again. I've gone back through all of my internet history, and on the 10th of December 2018, I searched for all variations of demon dogs, two-headed wolves, etc. I remember not feeling like any of it actually explained what I saw at all. I think because the true focus of the dream was the two-headed massive wolf that was walking with him. So he steps completely out of the forest, this beast thing on a leash with him, and I'm staring, and then he just turns his head and looks directly at me. He said nothing. It was just a silent moment. My impression was that he was totally okay with me there. I wasn't scared. There was no mistaking that this being slash man and this beast wolf thing were intimidating or could have put a fright into someone, but that feeling wasn't aimed at me at all. I for sure had the feeling that he was very aware of me before he ever set eyes on me. I felt like I was in this person's space. My entire focus afterwards was on this wolf thing. The lumberjack guy wasn't even a consideration. I felt like the more unusual thing that I focused on was the giant wolf dog. I found things like hellhounds and stories and such that seemed similar, but not quite right for what I saw. Until today, I totally dismissed this as a weird one-off dream that may or may not have had any significance at all. So I emailed her back and I said, did you listen to the other episodes where we talk about the black dog connection to Flannel Man? And she had not. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So she is seeing, or dreamed about rather, she dreamt about a big black two-headed wolf dog being walked on a leash by a Flannel Man. Here is Rose's account. 
Hi, my name is Rose. My dad passed nine years ago. He knew I was into the paranormal. About a year ago, I was asleep and heard my name. So I opened my eyes and at the foot of my bed was a man with a red flannel, black jeans, and a wide belt, maybe brown. His hair was black, thick, one length and a little past his ears. And when I saw him for maybe three seconds, he was opaque but wavy. I screamed really loud, shut my eyes and started praying. I like reading and watching about the paranormal, but I'm a chicken when it comes to seeing or hearing anything that may be paranormal. The thing I questioned about it being my dad was not the age he looked in the vision, it was the flannel. The guy in the flannel was about 30 years old. I know in the afterlife you can choose what age you want to be. My dad probably would have chosen 30 years in his afterlife. My dad at 30 liked to dress sharp in his youth. He wore suits and dress shirts with dress pants. He even had the thick black hair that he could slick back. My flannel man had it loose. I just caught on to Strange Familiars a couple of weeks ago on YouTube. My dad was 78 when he passed, and right now I'm 50-something. I don't even know why I'm responding since my experience was so short and maybe or maybe not real. I guess because it happened before I saw it on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> so isn't that everyone's question, though? Maybe or maybe not real, right? Yeah. I mean, not everyone, but certainly a lot of them. Yeah, like, is it? And she wrote back to say that, you know, she had thought it was her father, mm-hmm. but now... Like, it's questioning that because uh, of these other stories. So here's where Flannel Man takes a bit of a weirder and darker turn. Christina was on the show before. She had multiple Flannel Man encounters. I'm not sure which Flannel Man episode she was on wasn't the first one might have been the second or third episode she was the one who had multiple encounters and then she would have deja vu experiences often after seeing this entity earlier in 2018 she started seeing him again she would detail the experience very very interesting it started with the smell of sulfur outside of her home and then she started seeing this flannel man entity again and then she was given a dream in which uh, she saw something pretty pretty horrifying and was given a date in the dream. She actually saw the police report with the date on it. She woke up, wrote the date down, and then wrote me afterward and said, this happened, you know. Basically, she was shown a shooting that happened, in a sense. And mm-hmm. let's, let's hear her story, and then we'll talk about the actual shooting. I don't talk about the shooting itself mm-hmm. with Christina. She seemed a little freaked out by the whole thing. So, I think so like, why yeah. go into the details mm-hmm. of the shooting in the interview? You know, she was she was nice enough to share mm-hmm. her interview and, and experience with me, and I would certainly be freaked out as well. So let's go ahead and hear Christina's story, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about the actual shooting that it seemed to predict. Okay. I mean, you seem a little freaked out in the email. Are are you as freaked out as as that came across? Yeah, I mean, it's happened before um, where I've had dreams that have kind of played out. And it's usually like relatively mundane things, kind of negative sometimes, well, most of the time. But I've never actually gotten like a date. And I think we talked before where like a lot of my dreams are things that happen like months or even like years after I've had them. Right. And there were these kind of like deja vu experiences. Yeah. Yeah, And nothing like really extremely profound with those, just weird. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess uh, since the last time we talked, have you seen flannel man again? Yes. Okay. Was he relative or was seeing him relative to this dream experience or precognitive dream? Yeah, it was. All right. So was it in the same dream or just like leading up to it? Um, you know, he had been appearing like it seems to come in waves with him where like, I won't see him for an extended period of time. And then I'll have like a week or a month where he appears um, just more frequently. And th- it was during a time where he was showing up more frequently. And I want to say that I saw him that same evening. Um, and it was kind of weird. The way my room is set up, 
and where I was sleeping, I was facing my door that kind of opens up into a hallway and I'd kind of closed my eyes and then I reopened them and I could see, and it was somebody standing to where it looked like they were like peering around the corner of the door. And, you know, I wasn't shocked or anything. And I think it's because I've seen this so many times. I was just like, oh, great. There he is again (laughs) type thing. And then I just went to sleep. And I mean, you mentioned in our previous interview that you, you know, you had sort of multiple encounters with this entity, whatever it is. Do you think it's the, it's this, for lack of a better word, it's the same guy over and over again? I think for me, I'm listening to some of like the other flannel man experiences. I don't know that it's the same, the same being in all of them though. Oh yeah. No, I think everybody's seeing a different entity that just happens to be wearing plaid. <laughs> <laughs> but do, the the guy that you're seeing, the one that's appearing to you. Yeah, it's the same one. It's, it's, he looks the same every time. Pretty yeah. Much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this is some pretty dark stuff. And what's the best way to tell it? I guess start with the dream, right? Yeah, I guess I'll start with that. And it's weird when, the, when these dreams happen to me. It's like I am living in the dream at the time, if that makes sense. Even if if it's not me living, like I'm not necessarily me in the dream, Mm -hmm. but I'm experiencing it. I don't know how to describe that in a better way. So I was in this space, like kind of a more open space. And I couldn't tell. I was like, am I in an auditorium? Am I in a church? Am I in like a large grocery store? It was just a a large kind of open space. And I'm looking around trying to figure out like why I'm there and what I'm doing. And I see everybody around me primarily is like African-American mostly. And so I was like, okay, this is interesting. And so I'm like walking up this hall or aisle or something. And all of a sudden this white guy comes in and he just starts shooting at people. And in my dream, like nobody was really saying anything, but I felt like this guy is here and he's trying to kill people because of the color of their skin. Mm-hmm. Like that was, that was his motivation. And then I went from that occurring, like abruptly out of that. And I was in a police precinct and I was a cop and I was looking down at a piece of paper that described the incident and it had a date on it. And I was like, okay. And in my dream, and I kind of like lucid dream quite a bit. And so I like in my dream, I remember thinking I need to remember this date. It's important. And then I woke up. And so immediately I went and I circled the date on my calendar. And I was just like, I don't know what that meant. You know, like it obviously was very violent and it was scary. And I was given some kind of a date. And so since these have kind of been coming to me like this, I was like, you know what? I think I'm going to like tell somebody else about this because I've never told, like I don't talk to my husband about it or I don't talk to people about it because it's, it's weird. Sure. And yeah, yeah, it's, people can't really like understand. And probably I mean, it's just, a hard thing to bring up. I think I'm dreaming the future. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a weird and, kind of thing. Especially when it's something like super violent. And it's not like I had a place necessarily, just this date and an incident. And so I told my husband about the dream and uh, it being like African-American and there being a white guy and everything and the date. And so um, this was like at least a month before the date. And so I remember saying to him, like, I think I'm not going to send the kids to school that day just because obviously with all like the school shootings and stuff, I was like, I couldn't like, I couldn't live with myself if something happened that day. And I ignored this. Yeah, no, I totally get that. And so I like purposely held the kids out of school that day, you know, just made it a fun day with my parents. I had kind of talked to my sister-in-law about the dream too. And was like, you know, I'm just really bothered by it. And I went to work. I didn't watch the news like at all that day. And then I come home or go to my parents' house to pick up the kids after work, and they're watching TV, and there's been another shooting. And I did. I was like, oh my gosh, and I didn't 
didn't really want to like know about it. I was really bothered and I was like, okay, maybe it's just a coincidence. It's America. There's a lot of mass shootings, unfortunately. Like I said, I'm like making up excuses about how this isn't really connected to my dream. And then I think it was like the next day they started talking about like this guy in the parking lot actually saw the shooter going in and the shooter said something to him like white people don't shoot other white people. And he went in and it was like a race motivated shooting. And he, like, apparently he had gone and like tried to go into a primarily black church and everything. Like he was just like a racist and was killing African American people. And so after I heard that, I was like, Oh my gosh, I didn't know really what to, what to make of it. My husband was kind of, a little freaked out. Yeah, and you said you in the past you, you really hadn't shared this stuff with him too much, right? No. So, so first, oh boy, there's. Um, have you had any dreams that you feel are precognitive since then? Yes. Did you write them down? I did, and I wasn't given a date or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and it really mundane Mm -hmm. and it actually played out and and I was able to like actively tell my husband what was going to happen really yeah and we were driving up the road and um I was just like I get this feeling that I'm like in another place and that it's happening and I was like this is going to happen somebody's going to come to our door and they're going to be selling. And I, I like, I couldn't remember what the, the company's name was, but I was like, it's about money. Like they're going door to door about money, which is an odd thing because like missionaries go door to door. Girl scouts might come knocking at your door or something. Right. But typically people don't come knocking at your door regarding some company about money. And, um, my husband's like, yeah, whatever. And I was like, she's like, I was like, no, I have a feeling. And like, there's something else connected with this another incident connected with this and i i can't remember what it is though i'm going to say probably like 20 minutes after we get home or probably even less than that there's a knock at the door and there's this like well-dressed man that comes at the door and he looked like a missionary and my husband probably thought he was a mormon or something and i open it up and he's there from um, an insurance company like i don't know if it was seen i still can't remember it was like you know one of the standard Mm -hmm. insurance companies or investment investment companies i think it was yeah it was an investment company so i open up the door and i'm like oh hi you know and he's telling me that he just started and he's wondering about what we do for investments and my husband like i look over at my husband and he looks at me and we just you know and we ended up kind of kind of knowing him in a, a roundabout way so i shut the door and i was just like that's weird Like, how would I have known that some guy was coming to our door to talk to us about money? And then uh, I can't remember, you know, the the rest of it had had something to do with um, an illness. And uh, one of the kids ended up getting sick like the next day or something. I mean, it was something like relatively mundane that was attached to it that wasn't like life altering or anything. They're okay, in other words. Yeah, they're okay. Nothing, okay. nothing significant <laughs> happened. Um, but I just was like, that's so random. Like, why I would be given that piece of information. Yeah, that is bizarre. And 400 years ago, you would have been burned at the stake for this. <laughs> for sure. I would not be like, talking about it at all. <laughs> you'd, you'd have to keep very quiet about this. No, it's incredible. So are you going to write this stuff down on the regular now? I I am. I'm going to really try to write it down. And it's it's hard because, you know, how, like when you first wake up, sometimes you start to lose that information. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. There are some times when this happens where it's like I wake up and it's very clear in my mind. And I remember it like the incident with the date. That was very clear. Clear enough. I woke up. was very bothered. Remember the date. And then there's other times where it's like I'm given that important information, but I start to lose it. And I'm like, oh, no. And so I try to like write down the relevant parts of it. I keep a dream journal by my bed and sometimes I'll have these, you know, really incredible dream. And I'll say, there's no way I'll forget that. I'll, I'll wake up and I'll maybe go to the bathroom or something. And by the time I get back, I'm, it's gone. Yeah. You forget it. Yeah. 
So I've been trying, but it seems like for the most part, at least given like a really significant thing, I'm, I'm, it's very vivid. So in the dream about the, the shooting, do you remember, so I, I'm, I'm assuming you looked at the news articles and so forth in, in regards to it. I've, I've looked at a couple of them, but I, I honestly haven't really been able to read much about it other than what it was because it bothered me so bad. Mm-hmm. Did you happen to see the shooter in the articles? In the articles, no. Oh, okay. And, I, I was wondering if he if he looked familiar from from your dream. I don't think, and and maybe I'd have to probably look back through. But in in like my dream, I didn't really get a clear picture of who he was. It was more like a concept, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Like just a. Uh, Oh, him being white for some reason was relevant because I recalled that him being angry at black people was relevant. I recalled that. But other than that, I I wasn't given a, like a description of him. And it, in your dream, do you feel like you were sort of in I, it was a convenience store or something? I think he, he shot up. Uh, yeah, I can't remember. It was some kind of like wherever I was, I was just like in a more open space. Uh, like a Yeah, I was just wondering if in your dream you were actually in the church that you know what I mean um and then, right that he first tried to go into yeah. and that's and maybe that's why I couldn't figure out where I was I don't know if I was being given like odd inform- information in kind of an odd way that I couldn't understand right because at first I was like oh am I in like a school auditorium I am am I in a church am I where am I type thing am I in a in a store like it it wasn't where I was wasn't really um, something that I could grasp. Yeah, and I, yeah, you wonder if it's that kind of weird where you're getting multiple, you know, lines of information there that you know mm-hmm. the, the church is involved, the the convenience store, gas station, whatever it was, is involved. Wow, it's, I mean, it's kind of scary. I, you know, thank you for sharing the inf- you know, this with us. It's it's incredible. Th- I think you said in your email, like, you know, I feel like there's something more to this guy, meaning Flannel Man. That seems to be the case. Now I'm getting a lot of weird accounts. Not precognitive stuff necessarily, but just weird stuff. I don't know if it's because we're shining a spotlight on the phenomenon and it's been kind of not talked about so much before or what, but... I do believe there is something. It's more. He's more than just a watcher. I don't know what that means, you know, but I do feel like there is something more here. Has anybody ever talked about like before he shows up? And it's not every time, but sometimes it's like I'll open the door outside and it'll just smell like really like sulfury. That's and I think really with the other house, the other house that I lived in, I always just assumed it was like the water because it it did stink. But um, before this, I'm going to say like a bout of flannel man experiences and dreams came, I had opened my, my front door and like it just stunk outside. And I was like, oh my gosh, does anybody smell that? Like, why does it smell so bad outside? And I had my husband go out and he's like, I don't smell anything. And I was like, you seriously can't smell. It's like, it smells like rotten eggs out here. It's like, are we getting like upwind from the... <laughs> waste treatment facility which is pretty far away actually well and i just being like that was that was weird and then the flannel man stuff started happening so that's something i haven't been asking people but very interestingly john keel the guy wrote the mothman prophecies he wrote another book and i'm blanking on it it's actually two books under different titles i think it might be like strange creatures out of time and space or it's something like that in that, he has a chapter called Bedroom Invaders, I think. And he talks a little bit about these checkered shirt entities. And he says in that they are often accompanied by the scent of hydrogen sulfide or sulfur. That's so weird. Yeah. So that's not something I'd been asking people previously, but I went back and, you know, getting ready for this interview, I went back and listened to your previous interview that you did with me 
and uh, you know was listening to you telling about that house that smelled of sulfur all the time and i thought oh that's a that's a weird coincidence so the fact that you got a sulfur smell and this was before this, this like a a recent yeah the so the smell came like literally the same day that he it started reoccurring and i had just been joking like literally had just been joking with my sister-in-law about the whole flannel man thing and i was like yeah i haven't seen him for a while type thing <laughs> like kind of making fun of making light of the situation and uh went back to my house and then had gone like back outside and the sulfur smell was just like overwhelming wow wow so how many times do you think since we talked last which was what um i can't even remember it was the beginning of the or end of the summer beginning of the autumn i think it's been a, it's been at least since before August, maybe I can't remember. Yeah, it's it's sometime in there. Um, about how many times do you think you've seen him in that time since we talked? Mm, probably like four to six times. Wow. See, and <laughs> most of the, most of the time, I tell people like, "Oh, you'll see him once; you'll never see him again." But th- there's a couple people that see him a lot on a repeated basis. I say him, them, whatever these things are. Um, like I said, I think there are different entities that people are seeing. You know, some people have them in a bowl cut and some people have them no beard at all, blonde hair, dark hair, you know, so it changes, you know, at least the appearance of them changes. But wow. So like when we last talked, you said you were pretty much just like, oh, here, here's this guy again. Has that feeling changed in regards to him because of the precognitive stuff? You know, I still don't view him as like a threat or like a danger to me, but I definitely take the dreams more serious now. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, for sure, if anything bad happens in my dream, like I really think twice about what I'm doing. And like, I can think of incidents like where dreams that I remember regarding car accidents and that type of thing, I will remember that dream and. I guarantee the next time I'm on a, on the road and there's conditions that are similar to that, I'm going to second guess what yeah. I'm doing. Yeah. And that that type of thing which you know, you have you have dreams all the time that don't come true and a lot of people have anxieties and they'll dream about those anxieties and so then it's like, okay, I need to muddle through what's just like normal neurotic anxious dream versus like a dream that I should pay attention to. Right. And you seem to be able to tell the difference pretty much. Like the yeah, fact I just you... have different feelings. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's really incredible. Well, if you ever feel like writing one down, if you feel like there's another big one, and putting it in an envelope <laughs> <laughs> and sending it our way, and I'll keep it sealed, and uh, we can open it up when it seems appropriate. Um, Sounds good. If if you ever want to do that, you know we could. I'd happily do that experiment because this is super fascinating to me. I don't know what I would do given the information you got. It does seem like like Mothman prophecies ish, and by that I mean they were being given predictions, but they weren't able to really know what to do with them because they either weren't giving given specific dates or they weren't given specific events, and they were given d- dates and so forth. So it's it's almost like you never get the complete story. Yeah, it's like I just need like give me like some more specifics, maybe like an actual place and a, you know, a date and time with names or whatever. But right, um, yeah, I guess. Well, that's the other question. When you were <laughs> essentially looking at the police report form, did any other information stand out other than a date, or was it just you were so focused on the date? It was really weird. So. The only thing, it was like I was reading it, but I wasn't actually reading it. And the only information that came out of that was the the general incident and the date. Like, looking at the form, I think the only writing that I could actually remember being able to visually comprehend was the date. Mm-hmm. Wow. I mean, this is, I don't want to put any pressure on you or anything, but were you to see a copy of that? report do you think you would you would recognize it i don't know maybe mm-hmm. uh, interesting i actually hadn't thought about that because that i mean that might be public information i'm not sure 
right? Yeah. Yeah, it really is. Wow. Well, thank you so much for updating us and, and sharing this information, Christina. You're welcome. So the shooting she was talking about, it happened on, oh my goodness, um, it happened in October. I don't have the, the exact date. The date of the news story is October 25th, but I think it happened a, a few days before. It happened in Jeffersontown, Kentucky. This is from the New York Times story. A gunman who killed two people at a Kroger supermarket in Jeffersontown, Kentucky on Wednesday tried to enter a predominantly black church minutes before the attack, the police said on Thursday. The man, Gregory Bush, 51, of Louisville, was arraigned Thursday on two counts of murder and ten counts of wanton endangerment. He was ordered held with bail set at $5 million. The victims, Vicki Lee Jones, 67, and Maurice E. Stallard, 69, were both black, while Mr. Bush is white. And the article goes on from there. People can research more if they want. But it was really, really interesting. She said in the dream she was in an auditorium, which she felt was an auditorium. She couldn't tell if it was a church. Mm -hmm. uh, with black people and she felt this guy came in and she she felt he was there you know to hurt people and it was based on race so it seems like she was given some information about this and she got the date right pretty intense and that's it's, not one of those powers i want to have no no and it's it's connected to this this flannel man that she keeps seeing repeatedly you told me you only see him once. <laughs> yeah. I'm counting on that. Um, well, some people see him more than once, and that's coming up as well. In, uh, in I'm not these, one of those people. In these story, <laughs> you're, you're entirely convinced. Oh. I hope that's the case. Continuing with the weirdness with Flannel Man, Luke wrote me, said he'd been listening to Strange Familiars, mm -hmm. Then he woke up and saw Flannel Man. Now you're giving people nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> really interesting thing about Luke is he saw a series of symbols before he saw Flannel Man. And I asked him to draw the symbols, and they looked really, really familiar to me. And we're not entirely sure, Luke and I, but we kind of did a powwow on it, and I sent him some pictures of these sigils I'd drawn, and he kind of thinks some of the symbols he saw might have been like sigils I had drawn. So I don't know what that means other than if this is a sort of uh, subconscious meme that I'm putting out there <laughs> and these yeah. sigils work in the same way. Maybe they've gotten entangled in a kind of quantum entanglement sort of way. Maybe they've gotten entangled with the Woolrich company. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? Who I think at this point it would not be a bad idea to solicit for ad revenue from Woolrich, right? S somebody keep talking about somebody flannel. should with, who makes flannel shirts should totally sponsor Strange Familiars. <laughs> There's no way around it. But in any way, this is a very interesting interview with Luke, and we talk about the symbols. And if you want to see the symbols, I will put them at strangefamiliars.com in the show notes, so people can see what we're talking about. They're not exact. But they're pretty darn close. They're close enough to be interestingly similar. And like I said, when I showed Luke, he seemed to think that we were definitely on the... Mm -hmm. They were of the same family, whatever he saw and the, yeah. the sigils I had made. So, and Sometimes when they used to do those experiments with ESP, people would get sort of like a one aspect of it right. Yeah, yeah. Like a shape or like a form, but it wasn't exact. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and, and he was drawing the symbols as best he could from memory, mm -hmm. so they scrolled up like movie credits or something. Mm -hmm. they, they kind of were scrolling by. It's a really, really interesting thing. You know, he had definitely heard of Flannel Man through Strange Familiars, mm -hmm. you know, and then basically saw this guy. So are we now spreading this like some kind of viral subconscious archetype meme? You know, through, I have no clue. I have been thinking that whatever this is it doesn't seem to have had a lot of attention placed mm -hmm. on it you know bigfoot a ton of attention placed on it over yeah. the years ufos all these things this thing is obviously a thing we've gotten dozens and dozens and dozens of stories about flannel man so how does it react now that the spotlight is starting to get put on it where, where for all these years it's been this sort of 
hidden secret mm-hmm. of, amongst the paranormal in a sense. I mean, like I said, John Keel did talk about it. A few people talked about it, but it's never had a spotlight put on it like this. I don't know, but it's, it's more weirdness. So let's go ahead and hear Luke's interview. So we're talking with Luke, who had a, like a maybe flannel man. He wasn't necessarily in plaid, but it, it sounds like he has some of the elements of flannel man and some weird symbols. And we'll, we'll circle back to the symbols, but why don't you just start by telling, you know, the experience, telling the account, and then we can get into some of the other details. Yeah, cool. I found, I found another little diary, which had, uh, where I'd, I'd written, written it down, kind of like the morning after it happened. So it was a totally normal night. We've got a house that's on three floors, and I've got a nine-month-old baby. So every now and again, I sleep in the like the top floor in a, a separate bedroom, um, just so that I get a good night's sleep because of work and things. Yes, yeah, so I was asleep, and kind of I don't know whether I was woken up by a sound or whether it was the, the sound happened in a kind of dream. It would definitely like the. I was dreaming at the time, and there was definitely the sound happening in the dream. But I woke up, and uh, <laughs> I woke up, and the room was like so dark. And normally, that that room up there has got like a skylight in it, so you'll get moon moonshine and uh, you know starlight coming in, even you know even in the middle of the night. And I don't think it was particularly cloudy, so. Yeah, it was just weird. Like, and then at the end of the bed, so kind of literally about at the foot of the bed, it's like a, a bit like credits on a, on a film, bunch of symbols moving up, which were, even though the room was totally black, these were blacker than black, kind of, it kind of looked like almost like, obsidian, you know, that kind of shiny black, mm. uh, like they've been carved out of something. Um, moving up and and then then that that kind of ended and then a a man with a beard and a red shirt just appeared like kind of next to where the symbols were so like if the symbols were still there he'd be kind of stood next to them and uh, I just got like it was at that moment I got just the most awful feeling of like dread in my st- the pit in my stomach nothing was actually scary like nothing scary happened but it was just it felt like um almost like a laser beam or something it kind of hit me and i just yeah felt really really scared and i kind of closed my eyes pulled the covers over me and thought right what's going on and yeah, that was kind of it. And I, I, I must have fallen asleep after that because I woke up. I woke up again, like in the night, and the room was back to normal. There wasn't that kind of extreme darkness. And uh, I thought, oh my god, have I just seen Flannel Man? <laughs> <laughs> so you, you had heard the podcast before then? Yeah, 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 yeah. And do you know what? I kind of thought, like, I, I think. I, I really liked the the idea of flannel because I'd never heard of it before. I'd never heard of that kind of entity. Right. I found it kind of funny in a way. Like it's not, you know, he's not like, you know, sort of like horned demon or something like that. Right. Here, yeah. Yeah. From the ether, it's like, you know, like I'm 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 a carpenter. I work with wood. I'm often in a very cold workshop, so I'm quite often like dressed like that myself. <laughs> so it's. I don't know, it seems like it, it's kind of like a very familiar, everyday kind of image, really. Yeah, and it, it doesn't have, I mean, for me, now it does. For me, now it has this very kind of, um, this deeper association, because I've had so many of these accounts. Yeah, right, but, yeah. But upon, when you first hear about it, it doesn't have the sort of, 
even if you talk about like men in black and the black suits and the hats and the you know the yeah. sunglasses and stuff they have this kind of enigma about There's a sort them. of men- menacing element to it you know yeah which seems to be you know at, at least at first kind of missing from this flannel man thing it's like what's what's the deal a guy in you know yeah. the, just a <laughs> red shirt <laughs> You said the the red shirt wasn't checked or plaid. It was just red, but was it a button down kind of thing? Yeah, I think. I mean, it was. Yeah, it was definitely red. I think it did have a sort of check pattern on it. Oh, okay, all right. Um, like big squares. Mm-hmm. Red and black is the colours that kind of, you know, they seem to be the two the two mm-hmm. colours that were going on. And um, he he was also wearing a hat. He was wearing like a lumberjack style. You know, the one where you can pull like down to cover your ears. And I don't think I'd written this in the email, but he looked, I've, I've written that he had very large eyes and it almost looked like he had sort of aviator goggles on, like old style aeroplane, you know, like those like leather goggles. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> which, after I'd like heard, heard you talking about the August of Fama. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, oh, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I don't know if you call it Jade's account from let's see episode 75 which would have been this week but won't be this week is that oh, that's the, I've, yeah i've not listened to that one yet okay um, so, so the halloween, halloween flannel man yes she described goggles on them as no well way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah she yeah she said that's it had so like crazy. and she described them as almost like kind of old-timey like maybe welder's goggles or something like that they, she said they look you know yeah. she described them specifically looking old-timey yeah so, totally that's very interesting yeah, there's that. Um, uh, it's a film. It's called Coffee and Cigarettes. It's got loads of diff- different like interviews with people, and I think Jack and Meg White from the White Stripes are in it. And Jack White's got that kind of outfit on, like the kind of old school, like you know, like sort of mad inventor kind of. Oh, I've look. seen it, but it's been years. I'm trying to remember. Yeah. I know he had a Tesla. He had a Tesla coil, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I definitely saw it, but I can't. I can't remember the elbow. I can't recall what he was wearing. So I asked you to draw the symbols, yeah, f- from the best of your memory, and y- you did. Is mm-hmm. it okay if I if I uh, post those with the? Oh yeah, so, yeah, okay, okay. And as I'm looking at them, I'm like, boy, these kind of look familiar to me. And I was like, why did they look familiar? And there was a certain way about the way you were drawing, and particularly with the your sort of ending lines with with these kind of circles. Yeah, and. The one symbol specifically looked looked a lot like there's a a certain way I I a little symbol I I often sign my artwork with when I usually when I'm doing a big piece and I don't have room for a whole signature I'll often sign yeah, with this, yeah. this little yeah. kind of sigil in which I ironically call my Mothman sigil because it kind of <laughs> looks like a stick figure of a Mothman and I was like wow that one looks almost exactly like that and then these other ones started and I so I. I'm thinking about I'm racking my brain. I'm like, you know, they really look like these sort of protection sigils I yeah. I made. And I've never shown them to anybody. I never showed them to you or anybody. They, I made them <laughs> for my personal use. But I took photos of them and I sent them to you. And I said, you know, I don't know. I don't want to make too much of this. But, you know, what do you think of these? And uh, you said they were pretty close, right? Yeah. yeah, it's that, like you say, the sort of lines ending with a circle kind of that was definitely like a motif that was instantly recognizable. Yeah, that the one the one that looks like the uh, your Mothman symbol. Mm-hmm. Um, that's that's the one that I know I definitely saw because I wrote I sort of drew that scribbled it down like, as soon as I wake up the next the next day. You know that kind of I don't know it's almost like a Celtic cross kind of thing, isn't it? With the dot in the middle and just yeah. And then when you sent that through, I was. <laughs> oh wow <laughs> yeah yeah Some so I mean, it's it, you know i'm not trying to make anyone's experience about me but i'm i'm half wondering if the podcast isn't in, in, in some way disseminating this flannel man information and and yeah. if it is on some kind of level if like somehow those got wrapped up in it in the whole you know subconscious jungian <laughs> y- y- you know mess that makes this stuff you know, I don't know. I don't have any strong answers. The, the good thing is they were protection symbols. So if That's if five kids, yeah, yeah, if, if they <laughs> were, if they were there for their intended purpose, and who knows, then that wasn't. You know, there's nothing malicious in their intent. 
at all. In fact, the opposite. But um, I just found it so interesting. Almost like kind of like what you know when, when I'm looking at them, like they just look way too close. And of course, I'll I'll put up images of mine as well, so people can kind yeah, of see what we're well, talking. I mean, about. I've I've done kind of sigils and, and things like that in the past, and and they didn't look like ones that I drew. Like you know, it, you know, you I guess everyone's got their own style, but mm-hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> it was really weird when he sent that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There was a, a couple of the ones that you done onto the. Um, is it, are they onto leather? I'm sorry. Oh no, no, no. They uh, they're little wooden di- uh, kind of little uh, wooden... Like wooden discs. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it was a couple of those that just yeah, just really. It was like it was like seeing characters from the same language. If you know what I mean, like mm-hmm. yeah. Like of the of the same ilk. It was funny because like after I had the experience, I kind of looked through. Like well, actually, after I talked to you, because I didn't really put much onto the symbols part of the whole thing <laughs> when it first happened. I was like, oh yeah, it's a bunch of symbols, and then oh, flannel man, if that's what he was. I looked, you know, through loads of different alphabets, thinking, oh god, did I find? You know, was I being spoken to in some kind of like mesopotamian language or something but yeah nothing really kind of fit with uh you know it didn't seem familiar anyway and i never told her this vanessa who was one of the i think she was in the first flannel man show Mm. she she emailed me and said i had this i had another dream and i think she was pretty in fact that this was a dream about flannel man this wasn't like where she woke up and saw him Mm. but in this same dream she saw symbols no way. <laughs> and one of the symbols did not look unlike that little Mothman symbol. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's very, very strange. I was like, and I said, did I tell, because I thought I must have told her, and she, maybe that influenced her dream. I said, did I tell you about Luke and the symbols he saw? And she said, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> now, she's, she was shown some other symbols, and she's done a deep dive, and she's very into like the whole Sumerian thing, and I, I think she's kind of you know, worked out these other associations. So I don't know if at this yeah. point she is still uh, on the same train, but with well, the, the first thing that kind of sprung to mind was, you know, that all the alchemical symbols that mm-hmm. you get representing all the different elements and stuff that was, you know, and that was actually what I first looked for and then looked at them and I was like, nah, it's not, it's not quite the same. It was, uh, yeah. And when you, yeah. when you said they were engraved, I mean, mine aren't, in, mine are wood burnt, but they're burnt into the wood. So they actually have an, almost an engraved kind of look. They're actually yeah. cut, cut into the wood with the, uh, with the wood burning tool. Yeah. There's like, yeah, there's like a te- definitely like a texture to them, which was exactly what the things that I saw were like. It was like, you know, despite the fact the room was like totally black, there was still a sort of glint of light on it. Like as though it had a, you know, it wasn't, they weren't flat. Mm-hmm. So, they had, yeah, they had some body. So when I first kind of hinted at this, with it was for a uh, a patron show, I I kind of mistakenly said that I I think I was just under the impression that this was like the sort of sort of first strange event that had happened, but it's not. You kind of corrected me and said, no, I've actually had other stuff. Do you want to talk yeah. about some of your other experiences? Yes, yeah, I mean, they're, 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 it's mostly dream based, really. Like you know, those the big dreams that suddenly come out and like you kind of wake up feeling like you've had some information given to you or, or something funnily like about i suppose it's probably about two years ago I had a really similar experience to this this one um again was woken up by a sound and next to the bed was like um again uh, a red but it was like uh, kind of like a sphinx like a sculpture totally red with a bearded grinning man's face huh. <laughs> as the head <laughs> and that's i mean that's like before i'd ever heard of you know I'd, n- I'd not listened to strange familiars at all at that point right right and i felt amazing at, like when that happened there it wasn't scary at all it was like yes <laughs> this is what i'm getting it, it felt like a affirmation of uh, i don't know like something good was around yeah, like I said, like, but most of the other stuff has tend to be kind of dream based. A there's like this blue. It's funny. The, the, um, 
bold colours seem to be a major part of it. A blue kind of electric entity of some sort that um, again just appears and doesn't say, it doesn't say anything. But it's like the next day I'll wake up and I think, cool. <laughs> I've been, you know, I'm on the right track somehow, <laughs> I've got no idea what it's there for. Yeah, I think sometimes these, they are just sort of like uh, signposts along the way, saying like, yeah, you, you either pay attention or you know you're on the right path. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you were given a sort of a feeling of dread from this uh, flannel man character. Yeah, yeah, but like um, a kind of non non rational dread. Like it was, it was a physical feeling of mm-hmm. suddenly scared. Did you notice his face or any any expression or anything on his face? Uh, yeah, I've actually written down that he looked a bit scared. Really? <laughs> yeah. Which I know from other like hearing other accounts, that seems to be a or like no, he looked scared. I wouldn't say he necessarily looked shocked, but he kind of looked a bit freaked out. Wow, that's so amazing. I, it's really weird. I just. <laughs> The fact that, I mean, the, the details that, so these are people who are, we're thousands of miles apart, all of us, you know, yeah. that, that, <laughs> that are having these experiences and the, the details that people are noting are the same. I'm super happy to, to have you on. You're not the first person from the UK, but the first person I've, who's come on the show. What part of the UK are you in? Um, I'm in uh, the, the south of Devon, which is like... Um... The bit that sticks out at the bottom on the on the west, like the very bottom, and yeah, towards the west. So okay. we're right next to Dartmoor, which is like a classic kind of weird area. <laughs> Strange things get sighted. I think there's a, yeah, there's a Dartmoor beast. I was gonna say I think like I think <laughs> there's I've I've heard of the Dartmoor beast. I don't remember specifically what it is, but mm. uh, are there black dog legends around there? Mm-hmm. There's a there's a little village called Black Dog, like. Um, Probably about an hour's drive from here. Oh, really? Um, there's a um, legend of a, I think it's a carriage which rides along a road which is still there, like a kind of really major road, and it's either chased or the carriage is following a black dog. Oh wow! Yeah, <laughs> that, that was, I don't know if you've if you've heard of the black dog stuff. It's somehow connected, I think, to Flannel Man. Or at least people who see Flannel Man are yeah. sometimes seeing these black dogs as well. Um, that's definitely something that's like a black dog is one of the things that appears in those like really trippy major dreams that I've had. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, it's there. And it's quite often pretty it's pretty scary. <laughs> it's like... Yeah, even people who have a generally like positive flannel man thing, when they see these black dogs on other occasions, they're, they're not real happy with them. Um, yeah, my wife had him appear not at the same time, but in the same room where she had her flannel man wow. sighting, and uh, she is not a fan. I'll have to say, <laughs> in, in in fact, these sort of uh, black dog dreams she had kind of she didn't like dogs in real life because of these dreams or visions or whatever they were she was oh, having. Tight, and, yeah, and it it's took had her, the same effect to me. It took her, you know, basically we had a total sweetheart of a dog on the farm where my parents lived. And, I, yeah. you know, basically took that dog to, you know, kind of being super sweet to her to kind of warmed her up. And now, now she's a dog person. But, you know, she, she wasn't <laughs> because of these black dog uh, experiences she had. Yeah, the, the the one that appears like every now and again, it's always, it's always got like a really sort of wild and chaotic kind of feel to it. Like it's rabid or you know it's 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 dangerous basically yeah funnily enough my um girlfriend uh when she was little uh saw a big black wolf in her bedroom really <laughs> she was, yeah when she was about three years old wow yeah, yeah see and i have no clue what the connection is there or if it's just a fleeting thing where yeah um, you know maybe people are prone to see things and these are two big archetypes that people see or if they're there's, directly related. There's that, like the French phrase, uh, but bête noire is like the black beast, which I'm sure is linked to it. Like, you know, like it is a total archetype. It's like a, which is essentially a wild animal, isn't it? That's um, ominous in its presence. Mm-hmm. I think it's 
Winston Churchill used to refer to his depression as his black dog. Yeah, I came across that because I'm collecting, uh, because of the Flannel Man stuff, uh, black mm. dog stories in the U.S., which oh, wow. there are a lot, oddly enough, Pennsylvania's full of them, and they're scattered elsewhere throughout the country, but Pennsylvania's yeah. just packed with them for whatever reason. And uh, I, doing the searches, I would come up with that, uh, people referring to the, the Depression as the, you know, the sort of the black dog. And yeah. uh, I believe Churchill, uh, especially uh, in the searches. So, yeah, I, I have come across that. But, yes. uh, I mean, the UK seems to just be, I mean, it's just like black dog heaven, you know, <laughs> <laughs> the, the sightings. <laughs> I have, uh, I haven't got a chance to read it because I'm, I'm, I'm so deep into the Bigfoot book I'm reading now, but I do have a book. It's right here. Black Dog Folklore by Mark Norman. And it's, oh, wow. it's all... Uh, Is that a UK-based one? Yeah, yeah. It's from Troy oh, Books. Yeah. What's that called? I'll write that down, actually. It's called Black Dog Folklore. And it is extensive, but it's it's all UK. It's it's just all through... Who's the, what's the author called? Mark Norman. Mark Norman. And it's Troy Books. Oh, I'll check that out. Yeah, I'd like to know more about, you know, the fact that there's a village called Black Dog. <laughs> it's just, you know, years ago, I mean, I was, uh, I, well, actually, yeah, you were saying about, like, kind of other weird experiences. I, 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 yeah, it totally ties in with so I'm pretty sure it was you that had said he had an, was it Dreams or something, where you thought there was witches talking like yes. a group group of women oh yeah yeah um in my early 20s i had these oh, i don't know whether they were i don't know what they were hallucinations something of and in my mind i immediately thought of two old french women talking to each other and it was almost unintelligible but it was just kind of like a murmuring thing going on mm-hmm. um yeah <laughs> yeah, that's that's very similar. Now, you know, I was a kid and I was very, very influenced by this series of books called Man, Myth, and Magic, which had tons of witchcraft stuff all wow. through it. Uh, Kenneth Grant wrote articles for it and, and a, a, a number of other authors. It was the series they just had at the local library, this tiny little library in this country town near where the farm was. I just happened to have this series of books. I would, I, it was like an encyclopedia. I'd get a different volume out every time we went to the library. So I was very young, and I'm reading these stories about witches' Sabbath and so forth. So I'm, I think yeah. maybe, maybe that was why I immediately went there in my head because I never saw anything. I just heard the voices, and it that's was, exactly the same. Yeah, I, I, the, the the only image I had was just a mental picture of a. I don't know, me trying to make sense of what I was hearing. Right, yeah, exactly, exactly. And I, I heard three, and this happened repeated times, this is like a repeated, that I thought was kind of a repeating kind of dream slash nightmare thing, although I, I knew I was awake. It was, I would, I'd be awake laying in bed when I was a kid. Yeah, that's exactly the same as, yeah. I hear I... these, these three voices, and, and I just, I couldn't understand what they were saying. They weren't speaking English, and <laughs> they sounded like they were coming from the room below me. I thought, oh, well, like that's <laughs> it's like you're describing what I'd experienced. Really, really, Honestly, wow! Like as though it's people in the next room. Yeah, yeah, and I couldn't tell what they were saying, and for whatever reason, I decided they were witches. I I don't know why. <laughs> you know, other other than the influence of those books, perhaps you know, in my young mind, I always thought like, well, maybe I was just reading too many of those man myth and magic books. But I, you know, for whatever reason. Well, at the time when that was all happening, I think I know it was just after that I read the um, Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries, that book by Evans Wentz. Mm-hmm. It's like sort of you know the the t- the, the tome about fairy law. Oh, um, yeah. yeah, and that's well, that was that was that was kind of the end for me. That was like, all oh, right, I'm <laughs> I'm I'm on this track now. <laughs> it suddenly made a lot of things kind of make sense, and I thought, oh, okay, so. This has happened to other people for ages. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think it really has. I think we've changed our vocabulary a little bit. Yeah. The way we speak about it. But I think, I, and again, maybe it's the fact that I'm just, you know, so deep into this Bigfoot book with Josh, who, who of course, has done so much on, yeah. on the fairy stuff. But it's just, 
it seems like we've been talking about these same things forever, just using different vocabulary. And yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's difficult for me to look at the phenomenon. Just taking Bigfoot as an example, as a physical creature anymore at all, because of all this stuff. Like, there's such yeah. a history of people talking about these things in the same language that they were talking about fairies and so forth that it just it's just become very difficult for me to view it as a as a natural creature i try to leave the door open a little bit in case you know someone does bring a body in one day but (laughs) you never know (laughs) yeah the further along i get the more i'm you know kind of closing that door little by little uh yeah definitely yeah i definitely because um i think just I don't know, like reading around the subjects and stuff, like the whole UFO and the, the, like the abduction kind of thing, that resonates with again like other weird experiences I've had where I've woken up in the night and uh, there was like uh, the half present beings that were trying to get me to go with them. They weren't like trying to take me away. And they were only kind of half visible. You no, know, it was so weird. It was almost like they were coming out of the wallpaper. <laughs> no, um, that's the kind of weird stuff. See, that's the... You know, like they were peeling a layer off the wallpaper back and looking through and saying, come on. <laughs> and, and I was absolutely petrified. You know, and but nothing happened. <laughs> right, right. You know, the 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 one I talk and talk about your goggles and so forth. The the, the you know, I'm the one where I I woke up essentially in a desert, and I'm I can't move. I look up, I could see the the sort of desert landscape a little bit. You know, with my peripheral vision and stuff. And then suddenly, these two entities from either side, from the left and the right, just kind of pop into my vision over top of me, looking down. And I thought they were wearing goggles and uh, old leather fighter helmets, you know, like pilot's hats. <laughs> and I, I looked what at them and I thought, <laughs> you don't look right. That doesn't look right. You're, something's not right. Why are they wearing those old helmets? And then I, and then I realized, oh, those aren't their goggles. Those are their eyes. And their, their eyes turned and they immediately just kind of turned into those gray creatures. Yeah, and, yeah. And said, we are the ones who take you in unison in their, Ooh, in their yeah. weird emotionless voices and i woke up i woke up and it was daylight and you know it was the morning i woke dead out of that dream at least i think i did so <laughs> you know i don't think i was taken on a spaceship to the desert but at the same time is a very very meaningful you know dream possibly an out of body experience i don't even know how to catalog it but yeah 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 it feels like you've really really been somewhere when that kind of thing mm-hmm. happens yeah, mm-hmm. it it doesn't have the same kind of uh, floaty feeling of a dream. It's you just feel no, there. It feels yeah. very. What visceral. I'm saying about uh, looking through my old um, dream diary, you know, like ninety percent of them, yeah, they're kind of weird because they've got that whole dream logic thing going on in them. But it's I can I can see like directly what was going on in my life at the time because it it relates to you know, like really everyday things. And then every now and again, there's one that comes out that's like, that's so powerful and weird that it's like, I don't know. Yeah, it really makes you feel like you've experienced something consciously, mm-hmm. as opposed to unconsciously, maybe? I don't know. Yeah, well, yeah, and it's, 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 it's one of the difficult things to relate. It almost feels more real than real life when they are mm-hmm. those kind of dreams, those kind of moving is symbolic is that a disservice to them because it almost suggests they're not real you know and i i feel like they absolutely are real they're just it's just a different reality we've shifted into somehow well it's pretty i mean yeah if it is just symbolic like well there's definitely something in like young's idea of the collective unconscious because you know flannel man <laughs> right <laughs> like, like you know like yeah, fair enough. I've listened to Strange Familiars, but I don't know. It's like it fits with a I don't know. Zeitgeist might not be the right word, but mm-hmm. you know, like a, a, a current, like what people are kind of generally experiencing, or something. I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Luke, thanks so much for sharing your story. It's it's a it's another amazing Flannel Man account. I just <laughs> eat every time as things go on, it. They just get more amazing. Yeah. I, I just find it fascinating. In fact, there was the lady that was on 
your show recently um, who'd experienced her and her daughter at the same time. Yes. And when she she described to have been woken up by a sound that was kind of in a dream but not. That's right, like, she did. Like, yeah. Oh, uh, what? It was literally like hearing somebody read out my experience. <laughs> so interesting. It's so bizarre. But I don't know whether we're getting... I don't know, because Jade's was happened a long time ago. Jade's the, the Halloween flannel man with the, the goggles I was telling you about. That happened mm-hmm. in 97, so that was okay. a while back. But it, it's it le- the accounts seem to be getting more more and more incredible. Um, is it a psychopomp, the um, word for like a sort of spirit guide? Because mm-hmm. that's kind of what I, I don't know, that's what it feels like. That's, that's what he is. <laughs> He's like a sort of gateway person. It could be, and, and I'm wondering if there isn't... Uh, I do think from descriptions there are multiple entities which are appearing in, the, at least taking different appearances. Because some people tall, describe as tall, with lighter mm. hair or red hair or or even gray hair, and then some people sh- shorter and stockier and so forth. And so his appearance does seem to change. The flannel shirt or the, the plaid or check shirt seems to be the common factor between between all of them. Occasionally the axe, not everybody sees him with an axe, but uh, often with an yeah, axe. Yeah, not an axe. Yeah, so I don't know if if there's a whole group of, uh, of entities that are you know just appearing this way or, yeah it's it's really really bizarre i need i need to figure out the key and i'm actually super happy to be getting stories from the uk and from sweden because my initial theory was like oh it's it's the american paul bunyan kind of uh, archetype yeah archetype icon thing but uh, even germany i've gotten some from germany as well no way so it's uh, i'm kind of Almost not glad to eliminate that, but it sort of eliminates that and opens up the possibilities. I think a little bit further. Yeah, definitely. So it's it's yeah. Well, I mean, I guess there's a um, not necessarily English speaking. No, I'm thinking the wrong way. Uh, Like a European element to it, maybe. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the thing. It's and the woodcutter, you know, kind of thing is pretty would be pretty similar across europe my interest now is like i want to see if the perhaps in japan do they have a typical woodcutter yeah. that appears to them maybe in a different guise than, mm. than ours is it the woodcutter thing or do they have an entity that appears how universal is plaid you know is, <laughs> do they have an entity that appears in checked or, or or plaid things that's that's the equivalent or or even in africa you know do do they have a woodcutter equivalent so that's my next sort of quest to see if you know this extends in some way outside of the kind of european culture cuz cuz that's where it seems to be right now america and europe yeah yeah it's uh, cuz i I've, I've been kind of like getting interested in saints um, like catholic saints and mm-hmm. Obviously, I'm a, I'm a carpenter, and I've just had a baby, so uh, St. Joseph came up, because he's the patron saint of carpenters, and he's also, like, you know, Jesus' dad, mm-hmm. so on. Yeah, suddenly, like, it's a, ah, there's a carpenter kind of archetype already there, um, but yeah, I'm, this this is a, uh, I've only just started going into it, so. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, it gives us more to look into. Totally. Uh, thank you so much, Luke. I'm so glad to have your story, and you know, keep us posted if anything, <laughs> anything else happens. If he turns up again, I'll let you know. Strange Familiars is brought to you by our patrons. If you would like to help us continue to make Strange Familiars, please consider becoming a patron at Patreon patreon.com slash strange familiars for three dollars a month you get extra shows we do at least one extra show a month sometimes we do two sometimes we do three but we guarantee at least one full extra episode of strange familiars every month for our patrons if you'd like to go in at another level of support you can get things like t-shirts stickers pins copies of my books cds and more there's all kinds of levels of support there at patreon.com slash strange familiars And of course, we always want to thank our patrons because without you guys, we could not make Strange Familiars. So thank you so much for your support. 
If you don't like the idea of a monthly subscription like Patreon and you still want to help, there's a paypal.me link at strangefamiliars.com in the show notes. You can always make a one-time donation using that link. Other ways you can help are to like and share the podcast on social media and give good five-star reviews wherever you listen to podcasts and subscribe everywhere. comes from Kyle. Here's my story. My dream didn't seem like it was going to be bad. Sometimes I can sense when it's about to turn bad. It started out with my family and I on a camping trip in some cabin in what seemed to be a forest. I heard from the window noises in the woods like rustling leaves, so I walked out onto the porch and saw a disheveled looking man running asking for help. He asked if we can hide from the man chasing him. My father asked what man? And then off in the distance, I saw a man slowly walking through the woods in what is clearly a red flannel shirt. At that point, I woke up suddenly. Here's where the sleep paralysis kicks in. As I look towards the corner of my bed and standing there is the same flannel man I saw in my dream. The typical symptoms of sleep paralysis had happened. I couldn't move or speak, but only a few moments later, I awoke and snapped out of it and rolled over away from that direction. It only lasted a few seconds, but that's one of the occasions that lands right in my top 10 sleep paralysis moments, which I don't want to have a top 10 sleep paralysis <laughs> moments. Flannel man jumped from the dream yeah. into his room. That's pretty wild. All right, so more indications that Flannel Man may be something more than just sort of a a watcher or a ghost or something like that. This comes from Barbara, and she wrote the story of Flannel Man as a possible harbinger of death. Basically, during the last few years of my mom's illness, she regularly saw people that we could not see. Most seemed to have a family connection to her. She was a little limited in her communication skills, so it was hard to get her to tell us who they were. She would see them across the street, in restaurants, and of course at home. Sometimes they would reach their hands out to her, and other times just stare at her. More than a few times, I awoke to her having an involved conversation with them. She could be frightened by the experience, and confused. This went on up until the time she went into a coma. There is a precedent in our family for seeing dead relatives as the person gets closer to death. The premise being that they help a person cross, holding their hand. I was unsure where to put her hallucinations. Was it Alzheimer's, or was this the family belief, or both? A few days before she died, I saw a group of people appear in the room where she was sleeping. About 12 to 15 people appeared, standing between me and a TV, with the sound turned off. I could not make out any faces, but I could hear an active conversation. I wasn't processing well mentally, and I remember thinking, What the hell are all these people doing here? They're going to wake Mom. I could not see any distinctive features. It was very vague visually, and it disappeared after a few moments. The next day, my brother came over, and I left him alone with Mom, but I did not mention anything about the previous day. When I came back in the room, he said that he was hearing people talking, but couldn't figure out where they were. He walked through the house, looked up in the attic, and outside around the house, trying to find what he was hearing. I could not hear what he was talking about at that time, and he got annoyed when I said I wasn't hearing anything. This brother does not believe in ghosts or anything weird, and is very dismissive of people who claim to experience it. Maybe this is why I didn't say anything about my experience. About 48 hours after this, my sister saw her flannel guy. At this point, I feel that my mom held a door open, and we occasionally were able to see in. My sister and I were extremely close to mom in her last years, and I think this closeness facilitated our experiences. After mom died, the house was very quiet, no weirdness of any kind. It was as if the door was slammed shut and everyone left the party. We just passed the anniversary of her passing, and it still seems like yesterday. The following was related to me by my sister. She had an encounter with a being on the morning of my mother's passing about a year ago. We were caring for my mother the last few weeks of her life at the house. She had complications from Alzheimer's, pneumonia, and had gone into a coma for the last three days. I slept in a room with my mother, and my sister had her own bedroom. We had hospice people coming in and out, but they were in a different part of the house from my sister. 
the morning of my mother's death, about four to five in the morning, she woke up to notice a man standing next to her bed on her right. She sat up in bed and looked right at him. She was puzzled at how he got in, who he was, and he looked at her like he knew her. He was within a few feet of her when he slapped his leg and said, Well, come on, get up, you're going to miss it. She said he wore a red flannel shirt, her exact words, and dirty jeans. He had long hair and a beard, salt and pepper color. She described him as dressed like a prospector or a lumberjack. She said she never felt afraid, just puzzled by it, but also kind of excited. He faded away right in front of her, and she got out of bed. My sister regularly gets out of bed at four in the morning, so this was not an odd time for her to be awake. She came to where I was with my mother and started looking around and out the window. She told me about the man, but I was caught up thinking about what I had to do for mom, so I didn't pay attention that hard. It wasn't until months later that she brought it up, and I paused to consider the significance of it. The last two weeks of my mom's passing, we experienced a number of odd and unexplained occurrences, but this was the most out of place. My sisters told me on occasion about her dreams, but they were usually pretty uneventful, and the people were usually relatives. My sister said she didn't know anyone like what she saw. That's pretty neat and intense experience. At the same time that Barbara sent that email, and I mean within... I remember it was within the... A- day or hours maybe yeah very very close to that and i cannot find this email i lost this email i've I've searched all through my my emails through facebook through gmail i don't know what i would have done with this but someone else had written me and if you're listening please write again yeah please write in again she had had a dream where she was attacked by a flannel man entity in the dream and she woke up saying something like the Grim Reaper doesn't wear robes, he wears red flannel, or something like that, that she told her husband when she woke up from this dream. So, if that was you, I misplaced your email, please write in again, and I can get the details correct in the dream, because it was really, really neat, but it came in within a day, maybe, of this Yeah, I remember you mentioning it, because it was so odd, like, a lot of times things will seem to come, like, um, people it'll be people mentioning things for other people will come in on the same day or or some relationship will be similar. So this is our first flannel woman account from Raul who wrote in. I was born in what used to be West Berlin in 1971 and spent many years playing in punk and grindcore bands in the 80s and 90s, but moved to Western Australia in 2005, where it's been incredibly hard work. My mom is German, and my dad is from India. My daughter is 14. I believe these may be important details. We've always had psychokinetic things happening in the house, and I've had a good idea why. The encounter took place on Thursday the 7th of March, around 5 p.m., outside of a residential property in a small town full of surfers called Denmark on the southwest coast where we live. I was finishing work on a building site and had had a major problem at work, the sort of problem you only have every 15 years or so, but had solved it. I was exhausted after nine hours of working in the pouring rain by myself. No one else was there, and while I felt a sense of relief that I wouldn't lose a huge amount of money or reputation, I relaxed somewhat. Again, according to my theory that this is an important detail, when I realized that someone was standing next to me on my left, only a foot away, and staring at me at real close proximity— and it freaked me out so bad it made me literally jump, and I started falling backwards over a flower pot. I had not heard anyone approaching. As I'm falling, I managed to process the following information. It's someone standing very still looking at me. A woman dressed in clothes but not usual for a building site, namely long sleeve red and black flannel shirt, blue work pants, not very dirty. It's a woman with shoulder-length long black hair. In fact, I remember that Within this second, the thought registered that she looked a little bit like Joan Jett from the album Up Your Alley. While I clumsily hit the wet ground, and I feel like an idiot, it's a woman after all, I wonder why she isn't wearing rain gear and her hair is dry. She's looking at me in this creepy way. Something's wrong. I look away for a second in order to turn my body to get back up, and when I'm standing again, she's still there, doing nothing. Now I'm about to say something like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you coming there and try to study her face, as one does, and I can't seem to see her eyes. In that moment, she's gone like she's switched off. Oh, sh**. Then the flannel correlation hits me. I put her there. I must have. I've been listening to too many of the podcasts, positively marinated my brain in the subject matter for years, mainly Sasquatch Chronicles, 
dogman encounters, where did the road go, and a lot more, like coast to coast with those nutty collars. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, I look around the corner. You never know, and of course, no one's there. No car parked, nothing. I pack my things and go home. I'm not scared. I'm puzzled and shaken, but also feel somewhat confirmed about my theory of reality. Today, I'm rather excited about this happening, but seriously don't need this form of surprise apparition to repeat itself. The place next door has security cameras, but it turns out the encounter happened in a blind spot. While I'm writing this at 4.30 p.m. on a Saturday, my wife and daughter come back from a shopping trip in Albany. My daughter has bought herself a red and black flannel shirt made in China. What are the chances? I guess while I'm thinking, writing about the flannel, the thought must have rubbed off on her 50 kilometers away. I don't know what to think, but I might have to have a little glass of port now. Stay indoors, that sort of thing. (laughs) So uh, that was the first flannel woman account that we've gotten we've gotten more since equal opportunity so doug was on the show a creature called brownie so we've heard from doug before and he also emailed and said you know i've seen a person in flannel but it was a woman So it turns out our second Flannel Woman account that we've collected, I believe. Oh, Oh. maybe this is the one I was thinking of, because didn't it come in like like very soon after the other one? Like it was maybe in the same week or so we got two Flannel Women. Oh, yeah, yeah, totally. Yep. Yeah, they came in very close together, but Doug's was the same. I mean, chronologically, his probably happened first, but it was the second one that, that we collected. All right, so we're talking with Doug once more. He's back. He told us his story about the little possible albatwitch creature named Brownie before. And he had mentioned this to me, and I did not get the story at the time, that that he had a sort of encounter with an entity in a checked or plaid shirt, but not a flannel man, perhaps a flannel woman. And he's going to tell us that story tonight. So, Doug, go ahead and take it away. Well, thanks for having me back. And... This all started back in 1994. I'll give you a little setup before the encounter. We had moved to the Chicago area to open a Whole Foods store in River Forest. I was working as a buyer for Whole Foods, and my wife was the department team leader for nutrition. And we found an apartment in Oak Park. It was uh, near the Frank Lloyd Wright district. It was an old Victorian brownstone building. And the first night I was there... Something that I cannot explain happened. I was used to sleeping on the, maybe if you're standing at the foot of the bed, I was used to sleeping on the left side. And we got a new bed, and my wife wanted to switch. And so I'm sound asleep. It's the middle of the night. And I rolled over the wrong way. And I'm suddenly awake. I find myself hurtling towards the hardwood floor. And uh, I had no sooner thought this is going to hurt. And my face was like approaching the floor. Something or someone caught me in midair before I hit. And I'll give a nod to Douglas Adams, the author of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and borrow a line. I hung in the air Exactly the way a brick doesn't. <laughs> that is a great line. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. And then I was gently lowered to the floor. I have no explanation for what caused that. And that was my initiation to this strange apartment. So, you know, we started, started work opening the store and uh, we had our two toddlers with us and we had alternating shifts so that one of us could always be with the kids. And one day when I got back from work, I lay down on the bed to close my eyes. The kids were entertained, and no sooner had I closed my eyes, but I started to flash on like a past life memory. And this is something that might be of interest to your listeners in terms of checking it out, because if something isn't, I don't know, what's the term where you, where you can 
corroborate it with history, if you can check the facts. Um, it might have just been a flight of fancy. But I think it was a past life memory. And I'll, if you want, I can share that with you. Sure, yeah. Okay. I was in a suit of armor. I'm pretty sure I was a Knights, Knights Templar. And we were on the losing end of this battle that had taken place. I was laying on my side in a battlefield. Oh, look, there, there was like a gully. There were dead horses. There were dead companions of mine. And there were also the, the enemy that were lying around. Uh, this is during the Crusades. So the air was thick with smoke. There was a smell of excrement. <laughs> Let's just say that. Uh, it, it was horrible. People were moaning. It was. This is the aftermath of the battle. And my squire was hiding beneath where I was. There was like a gully, so he was like hiding beneath me. I was still, still alive. I, got a, I had a wound to the chest, like a spear. And the reason he was hiding is because the general or the, the, the Muslim leader who had defeated us in this battle was nearby. He, his nickname was the Kite. After the uh, crows or birds, the, the carrion that would land on battlefields afterwards. And he had a reputation of stealing from the dead. And he was uh, like walking around the, the battlefield, going from soldier to soldier, taking things. And I'm thinking, oh man, <laughs> this is only a matter of time till he finds out I'm alive and he's going to find the squire. Uh, he hiding below my uh, suit of armor. And I'm playing possum, and I, I noticed that each time he took something from a, a dead soldier, it, it could be on the side of the Christians or it could be on the side of the, the Muslims. He would, like, say a prayer and put something in, like, in a pouch. And it, he, wasn't, he wasn't stealing from the dead. He was taking a token to remember them so that... All the people who had been slain in this battle, in which he was victorious, but he was taking uh, a memory for all those that were slain. And he came over to near where I was lying, and I don't know if it was the smoke from the fires or what, but the, the page coughed, and he immediately, you know, like his hand goes to the, 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 his sword, and he looks down at the two of us. And he said something. I don't know if I understood what language he was speaking or if he said it in English. All I know is that he said, go home. There's been enough death today. And then I was back. I was back lying on the bed. It was so vivid. And I, I, I got the sense I was from, I want to say, Northumbria. It had something to do with uh, being close to Scotland or I'm not sure. But if you have any researchers and they know anything about that, was there a Muslim general during the Crusades who had the nickname The Kite? I'd be very curious to find out if anybody had any information about that. And were there Templars uh, up in that part of the world? I believe the second question, the answer is yes, because I know Rosslyn Chapel is up there and that has very strong Templar connections. And I believe uh, the Scottish in general have uh, pretty strong Templar connections. And then someone could correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the answer to the second question is yes. The Muslim general or you know leader, whatever his title would have been, I do not have an answer to that. But uh, yeah, I'm nor do sure. I. I'd never heard anything like that before. And so again, either it was a, f a total flight of fancy, or maybe there was something there that would be worth exploring. Yeah, it sounds really neat. I, you know, the, the past life stuff is always, I feel like a, I always, and here, you know, here's a guy who believes in Bigfoot, and I'm going to say I always doubt it going into it, and I probably blame people for that, you know, doing the same thing in regards to Bigfoot, but then so many cases end up being where people are pulling really accurate details, you know, out of these past life experiences that end up being, you know, you can check them out. In the end, I have to say, there's something going on there. You know, I don't know whether whether they're accessing their their own specific past life, or if we're able to jump consciousness sometimes. You know, in that in the way that 
you know, maybe maybe we jump into someone else's body for a moment in dreamlike states. I don't know. You know, I don't know the mechanism of it, but I, there's been enough cases of it where people have brought back, you know, accurate details where, you know, I just can't help but think there's something there. You know, what, what it is, you know, I can't say for sure. Okay. Now, before I get to the, the uh, person in flannel, there were two, two other things that happened in this apartment prior to that. My wife is, is one of the most naturally gifted psychics I've ever met. And one night while I was asleep, I don't know what, what time it was, but she tells me she woke up with sleep paralysis. Couldn't move, completely terrified. And she had the clear knowledge that uh, there was an E.T. in the hallway outside her bedroom. A small E.T. with a big head. And she, in her mind, because she couldn't move, she, she, I don't think she could even speak. She's In her mind, she's saying, all right, if you are what I think you are, give me a sign. And she heard the sound of metal, not metal, uh, of wood breaking hmm. and clattering to the floor. And that freaked her out. And she said, I'm not ready for this. I'm not ready for this. I'm not ready for this. And the next thing she knew, it was morning. And she woke up. Okay. She went out into the hallway. There were two halves of a pencil in the hall, hmm. right where she heard the sound. Now, the weirdness is continuing in this apartment. Well, can I ask a question? Did the pencil come from somewhere inside your apartment, like recognizably, or did it just appear there? Uh, we had toddlers, so it probably was one of the kids uh, that they were writing with or, or drawing okay. with. Yeah. All right. I think I mentioned on, on, on the last time I was on about how, how we'd, we'd seen our, our youngest. He was like a, 14 months or so. He was in his little circular walker, and he was in the living room of this apartment. And he was talking to somebody in baby talk and having a conversation. And we couldn't see what he was talking to. And I was like, well, that's interesting. All right. So fast forward. My wife was in bed. I had gone to the early shift. And... My, our three-and-a-half-year-old son, the el eldest, came in the room, and he looked very, very frightened. And she said, what's wrong, honey? And he said, Mommy, there's a monster in my bedroom and has one brown eye and has one blue eye. And he was terrified. And she said, all right. And she took his hand. They went in there. And she sees what he's talking about. There was this tall, Victorian-looking man with a beard wearing a, a very expensive three-piece suit with a richly embroidered vest. And he had one blue eye and one brown eye, just like my son had seen. And then he, he seemed very sad to, 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 to my wife. He went out in the hallway and left the room, and my son got back in bed, and my wife followed him into the living room. And he was looking down at the street and seemed very sad, and then... He was gone. So I double-checked with both my son and I asked permission, can I tell this story? And he said, hey, yeah. He, had, he was awakened that morning by this guy standing at the, end of, at the foot of the bed. He was like see-through. He was translucent. And that's when he, he actually like – he dove through the ghost in order to get to my wife's – where she was sleeping. And – uh yeah. So when I get home from from uh, Whole Foods, she told me what happened. And I said, oh, hold on, you know, maybe I can connect because sometimes I'll, I, I, I'll hear things or I'll sense some things. And I, I, I lay down on the bed like I had with a past life thing. And just as before, I had a full blown 3D, full immersion vision. But first person I was in this time, I was the Victorian gentleman. I was laying on my back in the street. There was a crazed-looking horse looking down at me with wild eyes. Uh, my back was broken. I'd hit the curb with my head, and I was dying. I was essentially reliving the death of the ghost. I was looking at the, at the crowd, and they were look, looking down at me. I was, I was scanning for the, my fiancé, who lived in the apartment where we were living. She lived there with her family, and he was, he was trying to come visit her. And, and then he was gone. So... 
what my wife did, she corroborated that she got the this, this, this same details when she was with the ghost. She has, has a way. I, this is something that I, it's not in my skill set. She can help ghosts move to the light. And she helped the spirit of this Victorian guy move to the light. And uh, so we didn't see him again after that. And that comes up to the flannel encounter. The, I don't remember if it was Ontario Street or Ontario Avenue, but that was the name of the, the street we were on. We had this living room with a bay window that looked down at the street. And right next to it, we had a small little room that I used as a home office. And I had a computer set up in there. We put up a baby gate so the kids wouldn't mess with the computer and stuff. And one night, I was working on the illustration for the cover of my first novel. Now, just to give you an idea of how far in advance this was, I didn't publish my book, Glamour Job, until 2008. And this is 1994, so it's like 14 years before wow. I was doing the cover design. <laughs> I don't know if that's hubris or, or just like th thinking things through in a, in a very methodical way. I hadn't really at that point written much of the story down. I knew an idea of what it was going to be about. But I was doing the cover thing, and it was like now about three in the morning. And I figured, boy, I looked at the clock on the, on the computer and said, I, I, I should go to sleep. I turned out this very bright halogen light. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a bright light and suddenly you're in total darkness. It takes a while for your eyes to adjust. Oh, yeah. And I, I was pretty blind at this point. And I'm putting my foot over the baby gate, trying to step into the hallway to go to the bedroom. And just as my left foot hits the floor, I hear a woman's voice in my left ear say, hi. And it wasn't my wife's voice. And <laughs> I'm reminded of the cartoons with uh, Casper the Friendly Ghost, because he would innocently say to some country bumpkin walking down a road, hello, and they would go, a ghost, and they would go running down in a cloud of, uh, of cartoon dust. <laughs> that was my reaction when someone said hi to me in the dark, like, boom, down the hallway, and I go into the bathroom, I slam the door, and I lock it, and I'm thinking, okay. As I'm trying to catch my breath, that was an embarrassing reaction. Here, here a ghost merely said hi, and you totally freaked out and ran away. And I unlocked the door, and I look out in the hall, and I didn't see anything. And I got in bed next to Ellen. I realized, oh, there's another reason to be mad at myself. I had not taken care of business in the bathroom while I was in there. So I get out of bed, I walk to the hallway, and then I see there's a young woman standing in the hall. She has blonde hair. It was in a 1960s kind of a flip style. If anybody ever watched the, the show That Girl with Mar, uh, Marlo Thomas, that style. 1960s flip, blonde hair. She was wearing a red flannel shirt blue jeans, and she had bare feet. And she's standing in the hall, and I'm thinking, okay, second chance. Hallelujah. So I said, what is your name? Very calm. I wasn't going to freak out this time. I just want to say, find out why she was here, what was going on. And uh, her lips moved. And I didn't, I didn't hear anything. So I thought maybe... I don't know what the, what the deal was before I could hear her, but I couldn't see her because I was because the light. Now I could see her, but I couldn't hear her. I didn't know if it was like a trade off or what. But I'm thinking, all right, how can I tell her with nonverbal communication because you can't really talk normally? How can I tell her that I'm not scared? I'm okay. She's here, and uh, the idea popped in my mind of this guy that I'd seen on PBS a bunch of times. He was known as Doctor Love. He was a big bear of a guy who was always telling audiences, come on, people, hug each other. And I thought, that's nonverbal communication. All right, I'm going to go through the motions. I'll put my arms out to let her know in, 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 a, in a fake hug that, that it's okay that she's here. Oh, I think I skipped a point that, that when I asked her, what's your name? I read her lips, even though I couldn't hear her. And she said the word Debbie. 
All right. So I step into the hall, put my arms out, put my arms around where I think, I don't know if my air, I thought my hands would pass through her or something. I don't know. I felt the texture of the flannel. I felt a warm body. This was not anything that I thought a, a ghost would feel like. It was, it was blowing my mind. And then I had a frightening thought. I thought, okay, maybe it's not a ghost after all. Maybe some strange woman has broken into our apartment. And I got afraid again. And I stepped back. And she looked at me with such, I don't know, like not, not quite pity, but like, oh, that's not, that, that's, that, that wasn't what she wanted. She didn't want to scare me. And then she just like evaporated. She just disappeared. So right in front of your eyes, just kind of right going. in front of me. Yeah. So I don't know if this was a, a a flannel person or what, but it certainly wasn't a normal person. Right. Yeah. What made you think ghost before real person? I guess so. I'm I'm assuming when you're looking at her, she appeared solid when you saw her. Or did she uh, somehow appear ephemeral? At that well, I don't, I don't. We'd already had the, ex- the experience with the uh, uh, the Victorian dude. So it's just the previous experience. Yeah, and and, and so I'm thinking, well, here's, an, here's another ghost. Okay. Yeah, it was pretty, pretty freaky. But, that was the haunted haunted apartment we lived in in Chicago. And that's the last you you uh, saw or heard from Debbie. Yeah. Oh, isn't yeah, that, that interesting? Was it. Isn't that interesting? So if you had to lay money on it, would you just say this is a ghost who happened to be wearing a flannel shirt? Or do you think it's just one of this these legion of flannel-wearing people that we don't know exactly what their purpose is? Or what do you think? Well, I, I think that, that it may just have been a coincidence mm-hmm. that the ghost was wearing flannel. Because I think the typical reaction is when they notice they're being observed is they're surprised. Yeah, that seems like a, a lot of the time. Yeah, yeah, that's like the go-to. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and she was approaching me. Hmm. A, a float of theory. What if, at some point in the future, they wanted to observe in situ people's lives? You go into their houses in the middle of the night while people are sleeping, and you can look at their artifacts, their 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 personal belongings. You can get a sense of what this time of being alive on the planet was like. And if if these time traveling researchers were going to try to find something that wouldn't be too scary or futuristic, they would take something that was good standard clothing from the eighteen hundreds right to the present. It's a big block of time where that type of attire is not uh, anomalous. Right. So maybe there's this group of people who are going in and checking out our private lives at night. Just a thought. That's the first time I've I've heard that floated, and it's it's a good one. I like it. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> who could say? But <laughs> but I do. I I like that theory. Yeah. Who knows? Do you think possibly the expression? of caring or acceptance or whatever good vibes the hug would have provided might have helped this spirit move on. I don't know. It's possible. How long were you, were you in that apartment? Like after that experience? Say? Oh, we were there for maybe another six months. Mm-hmm. And then we moved to Taos, New Mexico for another chapter in our lives. That's where our daughter was born. Well, Doug, thank you so much for sharing your stories. Well, it's a pleasure. I I, I have to again uh, applaud you for creating a safe space for people to share what many would consider crazy stories. But I, I, you're you're very non-judgmental, and you create a safe space, and I really appreciate that. Well, thank you. That's the aim. That's what we're trying to do. And one thing, though, if I could share a word of advice to the listeners, that Victorian ghost that I saw before he died he was just walking around having a normal life and I would encourage all of your listeners to take advantage of the time that they're still walking around and breathing to share how much they love their loved ones with them in other words just tell your tell the people you love you love them 
while you can. Before a crazy horse knocks you over. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, it's great advice. So now we're going to go to Felix, who is another UK flannel man witness. She saw him multiple times as well. So let's hear her story. Tonight we are talking with Felix, who has multiple encounters with Flattle Man or something like him. And I think you were the first person from the UK to contact me. This is a UK flannel entity, and uh, you have some backstory that goes with it, right? Yeah, hi there, Tim. Hello. Uh, okay, you want a, a brief bio and a, a bit of backstory, don't you? Yeah, yeah, if it's, it's, if it's, yeah, I think it's relative. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm a, a 60-something cat lady living in Manchester, England. That's, that's in the northwest of, of England in the UK. And as I said to you before, I hadn't heard of this flannel man phenomenon at all. I just came across the Strange Familiars program and I thought it looked interesting. I was scrolling through some videos and saw flannel man as a heading. I thought it seems a bit odd because we've had dog man and goat man and whatever. <laughs> and uh, I, read, <laughs> I read about the flannel man appearances and I thought, oh, hang on. This sounds like the person I saw in the doorway. Now, this was last summer sometime. I think it was around July, August. I have quite a lot of health problems, so I spent quite a lot of time in bed. Uh, reading. So, anyway, as I said in my original email, I'm from a family of uh, psychics and experiencers. But my, my my father was a a member of the OTO in the 1940s and 50s, and my mum was a, a spiritualist and a natural medium. So, any strange stuff that happened, it was fine for me to chat about it. You know, so I've always been quite confident in my experiences of strangeness i mean i keep a healthy dose of skepticism i don't i don't just take everything at face value but th this this episode with the, the flannel man was re really very very strange so briefly the first time this had happened last summer i was in bed and to give you an idea of the layout of the room it's about 15 by 15 foot square bedroom and the the bed head is against the wall where the window is. So if you're sitting up in bed, you're facing the bedroom door, which opens onto a corridor. So anyone who comes in, in, into my flat would come in, go into a little hallway, turn left. Uh, the bed, the bathroom is on their left, and this bedroom that I was in is on their right. So obviously I'd hear them come in. I mean, the flat is all on one level, so I would hear the front door open. The only other person... No, there's two people that have keys to it. There's my a good friend and neighbour from downstairs who would never let himself in without prior arrangement. And my partner who lives in a twin flat just across the hall. And it's not that we can't stand each other or anything, it's just that it's more practical for all sorts of reasons with <laughs> t teenage offspring coming to stay and all this sort of thing. But nobody could possibly have got in the flood. And this, this, is, this is why I suddenly jumped out of my skin when this guy appeared. I was lying in bed, reading, and I was leaning on the pillow slightly to my left side with a Kindle on a stand, I think, or in, in my left hand. And you know when you see something in your per peripheral vision and you know that somebody's coming into a room, it can be a person or a cat or a dog or whatever, but you see them before you actually focus on them. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So you see a kind of movement and a kind of darkness and you think, you know, depending on your living situation, you might think, oh, mum's home from work, oh, or, or dad's come to my room, you know, they must want to ask me something or whatever. Well, it was that sort of feeling, and I, 
it literally lasted for a second. And, you know, if, if you count a second as, say, one hippopotamus or one Mississippi light, I believe you do in the States, the, the, the sighting was literally only as long as that. Um, and it was an absolutely clear image of a man in the doorway looking at me, absolutely solid, three-dimensional, not woo at all, not misty or, or anything, just like a, a real man. And he looked like um, like a typical older biker guy. Now, now me and my partner ride motorbikes, and we see a lot of these guys around, you know, who are sort of in the 50s or older, and they have longish grey hair and a beard, and they wear layers of stuff to keep warm and you know, the worn jeans and the leather jacket and whatever. And he was dressed like that with a scruffy beard, longish hair. Uh, I remember he, he was Caucasian, he had greyish blue eyes, and he had, one of his layers was one of those flannel shirts, which was red, like a, a red check, quite quite faded, old looking. Typical old biker guy. And I really jumped out of my skin, Timothy. You, you know, when your heart just goes up into your throat. Oh, yeah. And you, you think, what? And uh, I think I mentioned, yes, I've got it here in my, my email, that we'd been having problems with what we call feral youth in the uh, the block where we live and around the building, um, gaining access to the property, harassing people on the fire escape for money, for drugs. And my partner challenged them and got, got punched in the face. And uh, the, the police were in the picture, you know, but... It, <laughs> At the time, I thought, yeah, a bit of supernatural help wouldn't go amiss. So um, I'd done an invocation for assistance of the Archangel Michael. I've done a lot of esoteric studies over like the last half century, I suppose. <laughs> I think <laughs> so old now. <laughs> I'd done the uh, the banishing ritual of the pentagram in for invoking the four archangels, um, especially petitioned Archangel, Ma Arch Archangel Michael to protect the tenants in the building. So anyway... I smiled at this person and then just went to sleep, <laughs> as you do. And I was still thinking about it the next day because it was such a shock. And then I thought, could it have been some sort of manifestation of Michael? Because he looked like somebody who could take care of himself and take care of other people. Maybe he'd appeared looking like an older biker because he'd looked like somebody who was in my age group and who had trust and you know, looked big and strong and was protecting the doorway and, you know, red is a colour associated with Michael in Cabo and he got the, the red flannel jacket. Anyway, I thought that was, that was very interesting. <laughs> now, a few days later, he came back and it had the same thing happened again, only this time it was between, I think it was dawn, it was between yeah the end of night and the beginning of daybreak i was still up reading and now he was dressed slightly different uh, differently he had a slightly furry garment like a it's like a sort of slightly vikingish i can't think what you call it waistcoat you call them vests i think in the states like a, a tabard thing mm -hmm. and that was quite sort of beat up looking it was the same guy same face, same hair same beard everything and the red check flannel shirt underneath. Oh, and he had blue jeans, you know, really old, faded, worn blue jeans. And he had a very serious expression. He didn't look sad, he just looked solemn, solemn, re responsible. And he, he, he looks at me, and, uh, and I look back, and that was it. And I thought, this is re really, really weird. Oh, yes, and there was a brief third time he appeared, and I thought, oh, for heaven's sake, not again, because it, it was getting quite creepy, Tim, you know, I mean, it, it, I think it's one thing to see, for example, something or somebody you might describe as a ghost or a spirit or a spectre, but to actually see a solid person in your house that's obviously, obviously can't have come through any door or window. I live 13 floors up, and it's all an electronic locking system. <laughs> to just see them there. Yeah. It really, really is shocking. I thought, well, there's nothing I can do about it, and he's not doing any harm. It says here that he was the last time it was a blue denim overall. He seems to change slightly according to the weather, which is a bit funny, really, isn't it? <laughs> um, but always the flannel check shirt. 
he disappeared, and that was September, so it was three sightings between roughly, July, yeah, sometime July, August, September, but between summer and fall. When you said you went to sleep, was he kind of still there? Did you just kind of roll over and go to sleep after seeing him? Do, do you know, I don't know. The first time, I think, if this makes sense, I was so shocked that I just went, oof, straight to sleep. It's almost like a defense mechanism, you know, when a, an animal hibernates. He's, oh, 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 don't to with that, what's going to sleep? Whether he was still there in visible form or not, I, I, I have no idea. Because as I said, I, I, I just fell asleep. It's so interesting to me. I did the same thing with my own, you know, alien abduction mm-hmm. thing. I, I just went back to sleep <laughs> you know it's yeah it's odd it's just an odd thing it like, is odd yeah i think it's yeah i think it's a protective thing i think the body and the mind close down because they need a kind of little recovery space and you just go and quite often i don't know if this happened with your abduction experiences tim but it's a very deep sleep and i rarely sleep deeply i have um me and fibromyalgia and various conditions like that that have set my body clock crazy but I know this wasn't an hallucination. I mean, I'm well enough to know what, what's going on around me all the time. It, right. it, it yeah. was absolutely real. And I went into a very deep sleep, and that was it. But the second time, actually, rem- I'm remembering the second time, he just disappeared in front of me. He was there, and then he wasn't. He didn't walk away or fade away. It was like switching a, a television picture off. He immediately went. As, so- as soon as I... S- Seeing him, acknowledging him, and disappearing all happened within the space of a second. And now, both of these first two times, you were reading and just kind of looked up or caught caught sight of something moving? Yes, I had a Kindle. I'm not, I'm not advertising Kindle here. It's just, <laughs> we're calling it an, e, an e-reader, yeah. I was leaning on a pile of pillows in the bed, and I was slightly to my left side, and I had a lowish, maybe 25-watt bedside lamp on, and then there's a soft light in the corridor. I don't have the house dark in case I get disoriented and fall. So, you know, there was no mistaking him, you know, no mistaking a hat stand or a, a coat stand or anything for this guy. So I was reading and I just felt that there was somebody in the doorway. And I thought, Christy, my partner, they, they, you know, I mean, there was no way they, they could have come in without me, A, hearing them, and B, saying something, you know. <laughs> right. right. We've been together 11 years, but she doesn't creep up on me for fun or anything. And it, it was a peripheral vision thing that I, I felt a shadow in the door, and I turned my head, jumped out my skin, saw him very, very clearly in detail, and then he'd gone. He just went. That was the second time. The first time, I just looked at him and went to sleep and thought, Oh, that's, you know, that's interesting. I went to sleep. Yeah, that, see, the deep sleep thing, too. That's, that's. Uh, yeah. I mean, and, and it's not just you and I. It's like so many people have seen these weird things, various things. And then they just report, yeah, I just I just felt dead, you know, dead asleep. Yes, yeah. Well, you think that logically, if, if, if it was a, a horror film or something, you'd be out of the bed screaming around the house looking for him, wouldn't right. you? You know? Yeah, that's. And, and he's, you don't. Maybe it's something to do with the the, um, the aura or the atmosphere that the individual person or manifestation produces that, it, that you're at ease, so you're not you're not bothered. Or I mean, I, I yeah, I fell asleep. I really, really did jump out of my skin. I, I felt my heart hammer the first couple of times it happened. It really, really shocked me, and then was followed by this deep sleep, literally within a matter of a second or two. Though he was sort of changed his clothes each time, that the the the, uh, yes. the red check yes. shirt was the same, or that was the, the... Check shirt was the same. It wasn't overly visible, Tim. It was it was part of his layers that he got on. The third time, I'm pretty sure he had kind of like a, you know, a bib and brace overall and the shirt, and maybe a cardigan sweater or jacket or something over that. The second time, he looked a bit Vikingish with these layers, but there was a bit of a flannel shirt thing going on. And the first, the original sighting, the first one, he looked like a typical middle-aged biker man, you know, huh. with the beard. and the, 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 the offer has it, because they need layers when they're riding. They'll have a couple of T-shirts and then maybe a flannel shirt and then maybe a vest and then a leather jacket. That It was that kind of thing. Right. Now, yeah. I'm just interested because uh, 
he seems to have a a wardrobe. <laughs> he's got a wardrobe somewhere he's changing into. Oh, yeah, you wait till Halloween. I don't know if I sent you this one. I may have done, but... <laughs> Talk about wardrobe. So that, that, that... <laughs> that's the next one, right? Uh, Halloween? Yeah. yeah, that's the final. Well, I think it's the final one so far. Do you want me to talk about the, the last sighting, the yes. Halloween one? Yeah, sure. Well, well this is quite f- f- funny, peculiar, and funny, amusing, because um, I thought... I. You know, I, I don't, I don't want something hanging around my home that I don't have control over. Don't mind something strange visiting, as long as it behaves itself. You know, this is my dimension, not not theirs. So, I formulated a, a pentagram in light across the door, and it was Halloween. My partner and I hadn't done anything particularly special. Um, I wasn't drunk. I hadn't drunk any alcohol, but I thought, right, okay sat up in the bed, and I actually said aloud, OK, whoever you are, I'll call you Flannel Man, tonight's Halloween, and it's traditional that, you know, the veil between the living and the, the earthly and the spirit realms is thinnest of all on this night. So, if you want to pop in, you know, and uh, <laughs> celebrate with me, that's perfectly fine. But please don't frighten me. And I just sort of giggled to myself, and I really, really didn't think anything would happen. (laughs) I said this as a sort of joke, Tim. (laughs) So I was doing my lying in bed reading thing. About half an hour had passed, I think, and there was the shape in the doorway. And I thought, I I looked round, because remember, I'm kind of looking just across over my right shoulder a little bit of this doorway. And the shape was there, and it was him, but... He seemed to have no top to his head, which I thought was pretty strange. And he ha- he, it was the same man with a beard, but the beard looked black instead of grey. And instead of wearing a flannel shirt, he had, you know, those flannel dressing gowns that you can get with that wrap around you with a cord? Like a, oh, yeah. A yeah. Man's, a, yeah, a traditional man's dressing gown mm-hmm. with a check print on it, which I think was like reds and greens and black, sort of like a soft plaid pattern. And in his left hand, he held a little glass with a drink in it and lifted it up. And then I realised, just before he vanished, of course, he'd got a top to his head, but he'd got a black hat on, like a fez. Ah. And, and a black, his beard was black. And I thought, it, you know, it took me at least two days where I thought, of course, he's dressed up for Halloween. And the little drink in his hand was his way of saying, I'm celebrating with you. Wow. So the... Yeah, the top of the head hadn't disappeared. He got a black, I suppose, like a fez, a mm-hmm. fez on. Yeah, and a, a dressing gown. You've seen Edwardian gentlemen dressing that sort of way. I'm sure, like Sherlock Holmes films and that sort of thing. Right, right, yeah. And I thought, oh, he's made a special effort for Halloween. <laughs> and I was quite touched. <laughs> I was quite touched. He lifted the glass and then he disappeared. I, I'd never seen him since. I haven't made any effort with, you know, pendulum dowsing or meditation or anything to try and call him up because I think it's too easy to kid yourself that way. I think spontaneous is really better in this mm-hmm. sort of situation. And, yeah, that was his Halloween visit. And uh, it seems to have gone now, but I'll, I'll keep you posted. Well, yeah. <laughs> in case he comes back. Yeah. Overall, it doesn't seem like it was, you know, you got a particularly negative impression. From... No, just incredibly strong, though. Like, like, more like a real person in the house. Mm-hmm. You know, and what puzzles me is why this person or archetype or whoever they are, what, why they, well, why they're there and why they turn up at so many places all over the world. Yeah, I I want to know what the flannel's about or the check pattern. I mean, uh, it it must be something. There's something to it, but I don't know what. After I finish writing the Bigfoot book I'm working on, I have to dive into the history of flannel and plaid and tartans and so forth and try to uh, see if there's any any yeah. you know deeper connection there. Well, I mean, you might let me. You might have a look at the history of tartans, perhaps. You know, because they relate to different clans of people um, the colours mean different things of course in occultism but it, it, colours mean different things but then again it depends what system you follow you, you, you see the colours red and green 
in traditional Kabbalah would relate to the sphere of Archangel Michael, although most people visualise him with a purple bluish light, you know, round him. But the red and green, uh, it's, it's too complicated to go into in, in, in this program, really. But they are associated with Michael, and the dressing gown, as I said, was sort of green and a little bit of red and black. Right. And what? the shirts always had a, a sort of soft red plaid to it. And the connection, with you know, the, the thing with me wanting protection for, for our home was to do with Michael, and then this person turns up. But maybe he is some sort of protective uh, person. Because he, he doesn't seem to have actually harmed anybody or frightened anyone so badly that they've had to move house or anything like that. Uh, you know, at, at this point, I might have... I don't know. I can't, I've lost count. I, you know, dozens and dozens of sightings I've had. The overwhelming majority, and I mean like 90%, are, if not positive, they're very neutral. They're very like, you know, people are surprised because someone's in their house. And they describe much as you do, like a real person. It doesn't look like ephemeral or, you know, like a hazy or anything. It looks like a real person. And they're surprised because he shouldn't be there. But most people aren't terrified or... You know, they they don't get a particularly yeah. horrifying feeling from him. Now, there there have been a few. There's a few people, you know, just really, really didn't have a good experience with him. But the uh -huh. the vast majority have been, like I said, either neutral or positive. And yeah. uh, I tend to think, for the most part, I, I don't know. I'm kind of now think there might be an army of these guys. And then they, <laughs> they, they might have different purposes. Do you think it's a bit like Father Christmas turning up at every house at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, an army of them. Well, it's an interesting idea. It's a, he is kind of an archetype, isn't he? Oh, um, yeah, very much. Very yeah, much. A, work, a, a mature working man, you know, regular guy sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, here we tend to see him as, as a lumberjack. I don't know, is the woodcutter archetype universal throughout the west i mean do lumberjacks in the uk dress in flannel shirts and blue jeans well a lot of working men builders would have an old flannel shirt that they put on blue jeans yeah you blue jeans are your big like the they were really something bleak then are you okay i'm sorry hello i'm here oh, sorry, it's okay something bleaked on the phone are you okay oh yeah yeah no i'm fine I saw that, probably being listened in on, that's a whole other story. Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you had to ask Nick Redford about that. Just every time I talk about something like this, it's either the phone wailing and screaming, or it bleeps, or it's... Uh, I've contributed to a couple of books by Nick, actually, about the men in black, and that's another, a whole other thing. Um, yes. As I said, I've got, I've got reams of experiences. I'm sure you have, too, but... Uh, yeah, this is this is very. It's just about the, the the oddest one ever. And the final thing that I mentioned just briefly, which I, I I don't know whether it was partly down to tiredness or expectation or whatever. I was in the living room. Remember, all these sightings had taken place in the bedroom. I was in the living room, December the second, I think it was, and I was dozing a bit, and I thought I saw my partner walk across the room, but. The walk was wrong. It was like a person pretending to be able to walk, like a a thing, really. And it had winter clothes on and maybe a woolly hat, sticks a woolly hat, dressed for winter anyway. And I thought, what the heck's that? And then it, it disappeared. But as I said, I'd been reading a book about the Dyatlov Pass incident, so maybe it was just some sort of, you know, uh, visual image. That I somehow conjured up, but it was well, for a moment. I thought, "Oh, heavens, is this, is this the guy again?" But it, it, what it wasn't. It wasn't the, the the right shape or the right feel to it. It's more of a sort of a tall puff thing, very brief. But uh, yeah, that that's my story, at least as far as the final man goes. For my own curiosity, and if this is you know something that you'd rather not talk about, that's fine. But do you, which branch of the OTO was your father involved with? Oh, gosh. Well, he spent most of his time j j during the Second World War. He was born in 1922, I think. Second World War, he was in Blackpool, Lancashire. And he used to study by post because it was the only way you could do it then. And I know he used to... 
he has communicated with um, was it Gerald Gardner at the time that was involved with the OTO. Mm-hmm. The man that evolved Wicker. I think he was because Gerald Gardner had some strange. Blackpool is a seaside town. It's on the northwest coast, and it's like sort of a seven-mile version of Coney Island. It's a, it's a crazy place. That's where I was born. Gerald Gardner bought a museum of oddities there. It's, it's funny how all these things link up. But yeah, I don't think he ever met him. But he used to study by post. And there was a Jewish man who was a bit of a hermit. I never met him. Well, I wouldn't if he was a hermit, but um, the, the, my dad used to visit in Blackpool, in Lancashire. Unfortunately, he sold a lot of his first editions when I was young because he needed the money. <laughs> oh, God, oh, don't, don't. We had that first edition of Isis Unveils by Blavatsky and all that. I've actually got in the cupboard next to me now a rebound first edition of the Equinox, the triple seven one that deals with the, the tarot and everything, which is wow. well, probably worth quite a bit, but it's, it's not going anywhere. <laughs> so re- really, yes, most of it was by post. And I, th- I think he wrote to somebody in London and then visited this, this gentleman locally. And he, he went to Adeptus Minor level and then, you know, life got in the way, I suppose. Sure, yeah. Yeah, he was, he was involved with other groups as well. I think he was involved with the Rosicrucians for a while, and that will be a mock when he, when he was a younger man. My mum used to sometimes go to a spiritualist church. I've got some old photographs of people from the spiritualist church in the 50s. What, what a bunch they were. They're like <laughs> they were both interested in all of that sort of thing, if you will. But my, my mother had some interestingly weird experiences of her own that we talked about. And they're all going in this book that I'm collating. I don't have a title for it yet. A working title is something like Wired for Weird because I feel I was wired for weird, you know, from birth, really. I don't think a lot of people get to grow up with that, you know? That's true. I was introduced to it at a young age, but only because my mother was very open-minded. She wasn't very strict as far as, you know, she you could pretty much read anything, you know? Oh, there, yeah. There, there were no restrictions as to what books I could read and so forth, and I just developed an interest in this stuff from an early age. I think I think later on when I got older and it didn't fade, I think then it bothered her. <laughs> but when I was little... And, and, and <laughs> well, my reading, father was an apostate Catholic anyway. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he was brought up by um, Christian brothers, I believe, who, who were not neither you know brotherly nor particularly Christian. And uh, he would never go into a church for the rest of his life. Mm. But... I think my mum had me christened out of, you know, because it was a thing to do, you know, as a baby, but um, he was very uh, anti-Christian. Um, but my mum was more sort of open-minded, but she had some experiences that you, you, you simply can't put down to, you know, coincidence or hallucination or wishful thinking or whatever, you know, just things where you think the universe is actually working in this trickster kind of way to interact with you, you you know, that there's other other levels interacting with the level on which you usually live, if that makes sense. Absolutely. I mean that's the the only way I can begin to wrap my head around a lot of this stuff. Okay. Tim. Felix, thank you so much for sharing your story. Oh you're very welcome Tim. Take care then. Okay. Bye bye for now. Alright, thank you. Bye bye. Keep the Flannel Man accounts coming. I know other podcasts are doing them. We got so many messages. Jim Harold's Campfire Tales or Campfire Stories. I forget what it's called. No offense. Uh, I just, it's not one I listen to. I only have so much time to listen to podcasts. He had a guest on who was talking about, not by name, but essentially Flannel Man apparently had glowing eyes. I have not gotten a chance to listen to it yet, but so many people wrote to tell me about it. I, probably a dozen people in different places emailed or commented on facebook or so forth so please keep the final man stories coming i know there's more and we want them all we want all the flannel mans <laughs> the pokemon of flannel yes we're trying to catch all the flannel man stories so if you do hear them elsewhere i absolutely love it when you tell me about it because it just helps my research for the book i'm going to be writing and 
if you're out there and you've had a Flannel Man account. Oh, I thought you were going to, you were actually talking to Flannel Man if you're out there. <laughs> Flannel Man, if you're out there, we'd love to interview First you. First time caller. <laughs> <laughs> Well, not to Allison. It would be technically second time. <laughs> second time. But no, uh, more seriously, if, if you've had a Flannel Man encounter, please contact Strange Familiars. Even if you contact other places too, please contact us because we want to be the home for Flannel Man. Not literally. I don't want to be the literal home <laughs> for Flannel Man. <laughs> it wasn't our objective starting out, but it's kind of turned into the sort of mascot of the show. <laughs> so thanks for listening, everybody. We will be back next week with another episode of Strange Familiars. Remember, you can always find us at strangefamiliars.com, and you can always email strangefamiliarspodcast at gmail.com. Strange Familiars is a production of Dark Holler Arts, music, books, art, podcasts, and more, darkhollerarts.com. Intro and background music is by Stonebreath. Go to stonebreath.bandcamp.com for more. And as we are old people, <laughs> according to our children, we are on Facebook. And by we, I mean Strange Familiars. <laughs> Allison is not on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Strange Familiars. And there is also the Strange Familiars Gathering Group there as well. If you want to interact with other listeners and share news stories and keep apprised of what's going on behind the scenes. weird thing that happened uh, as I was driving to work. Normally I get up and it's dark when I'm getting to the car. And this was last year in the spring and my wife and I both were saying, why is it so bright out? The sun doesn't usually come up quite so early. And it was a cloudy sky, but it was bright. And I got in the car and I'm driving up 9W and and I'm going through Port Ewan and and there's a a tall, I don't know if it's a red light on a post that's for planes that flashes over the Hudson, but there was something hovering right near the thing, and it was flooding the clouds with a beam of light. And all the lights were generating the light that I was seeing, thinking it was it was morning sunlight. And I'm, I'm looking at it, and it, it wasn't making a sound like... Uh, a helicopter, but it was hovering the same way a helicopter would, but it was pointing directly into the clouds right near that red flashing light. And after I passed, I said, idiot, you have a, you have your phone right there on the dashboard. Why didn't you take a picture? And so I, I didn't get a shot of it, but I'm hoping that if it happens again, I'll get a shot. Yeah, I I can't tell you how many times. <laughs> I've seen something and I'm, I'm too busy observing to even I, I, at this point I tried to take pictures of some of the lights we talk about at site 7 and they're so unimpressive on a camera they just look like little pinpoints of light it, it's, they're not really describing what they're going to do uh, Soraya said he will bring better camera equipment and maybe we can get some, some more impressive footage of them I my gut tells me that they'll either not show up or, or uh, not perform it, you know, they'll just look like stationary lights or something when he has cameras on, but we'll see. Yeah, I've, a lot of times I was like, I don't even try anymore, especially if it's far away because I just don't, I don't have a camera with a good zoom or anything. Yeah, so missed opportunity. <laughs> but this this whole area is a hotbed here in the, in the Hudson Valley for UFO activity, and I didn't realize that when we were moving up here. Yeah, we're right across we're right across the the uh, the river from uh, uh, Rhinebeck, and that's where. Um, Whitley Strieber had his experiences. It's famous for UFO sightings. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Master.
The olives were not blind to him The little grey leaves were kind to him The palm tree had a mind to him When into the woods he came, he came Into the woods he came Thank you.